Hey everybody, and welcome to another live stream of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. Thanks for joining us on YouTube or Facebook, however you're joining us. Uh, quick disclaimer, if you're watching the Tour de France right now, no spoilers. We got spoiled last week. Can't happen again. We can't be spoiled again. So it's an exciting day too. Uh, but with but that, not as exciting as this podcast. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. Um, so uh, we're happy you're all with us. If you want to submit questions live during this podcast for us to address thereafter, you can do so. Just go to trainerroad.com slash podcasts. Uh, forgive me. You can submit them right there in the comments below, uh, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. And then if you want to submit some after the fact, something perhaps a little more in depth, go to trainerroad.com slash podcast. If you're watching the live stream now, share it out with, uh, with the friends, uh, get other people tuning in so then we can uh, have some good discussion on how to become faster cyclists. Let's kick off the, the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. Our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. We're going to answer more of those cycling and triathlon related questions today. You can submit them at trainerroad.com slash podcast. You can find this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. That's pretty self-explanatory or wherever you're listening to this now, but you can subscribe on there too. So then that way you don't miss episodes. Um, I subscribe and auto download. So then it downloads on Wi-Fi. So then I don't get into this situation where I'm stuck and I can't listen to my podcast. So a little podcast pro tip myself. You can also set it download over cellular. Uh, it's on, uh, you can. Yeah. Data though. Data is limited for some folks. So, uh, we're glad that you're all with us. We're going to cover, uh, a, a, quite a lot of questions this week from all of you. Uh, before we get into that, just wanted to mention a bunch of conversations been going on in the ask a cycling coach podcast, Facebook group, some interesting discussions that people have been having recently on like theoretical, what if situations that I've found interesting. Uh, so you can go in there, see where people are sharing data to back those things up or where people just share kind of silly cultural ideas that, that also get blown out of the water at times. But it's interesting conversation in there. Head over, just go to Facebook, look for the Trainer Road Ask a Cycling Coach podcast group. You'll find it in there. Um, oh, and one other thing that we have on YouTube right now, uh, you can just go to YouTube, look for Trainer Road. Uh, we did a road race analysis, Nate, you and I did, but with our filmmaker, Dave Christensen. Yes. It was on a road race this time. Yep. So that's different because we've always done crits uh, or I guess a TT as well. But uh, it was interesting to see this one's known for like it's rolling climbs and one particularly tricky climb. And you get to see breakaways. You get to see breakaways get brought back in at times. You get to see a lot of cool stuff. So Interesting fact, this is the same course where I beat Jonathan and Chad in a Merck's TT. Yes, this mm. is true. Yeah. So if you'd like to see that. Yep. It's glory days. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> glory days. Back glory in uh, March day. or something. Glory day. <laughs> Minus the S. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> so uh, that's a – we – a ton of learnings from that one. And, uh, I, there's a point at which Dave goes over 50 miles an hour on his top tube and a descent, exciting mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's unfamiliar racers with him too, cause they combined it to combine two different categories. So that's kind of one thing that we're actually going to answer a question that's somewhat similar to that a little later on, which is cool. So, uh, check that out. It's good stuff. Uh, Nate, we should talk about, uh, what you did over the weekend really quick, the learnings that you have from the Tahoe trail 100. So then we, and then we'll cut it, get into the questions. Yep. We did the Tahoe trail 100 or I did you it. You did. I did it. Everyone else. I, I was there <laughs> in support. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you handed me some bottles. That was very nice and loaded yeah. up my Jersey. Yep. I bought a house. Um, yeah. Chad <laughs> bought a house. So he, uh, <laughs> timing didn't work way. out. Been yeah. moving. Yeah. That's, that's all I've been doing. Uh, it's so set the stage. It's what at 6,000 feet. Uh, no, it, you're closer to, I think you're 6,500. 6,500. So what someone described it, actually Dave Christian said, said, it's like doing a race at the top of Alp Duez. Yeah. And, and it really, I mean, you really get up to 7,000 feet very quickly there. You yep. know, you climb right up the ski run, basically. It's a Leadville qualifier. And for technicality, it's r a lot closer to a gravel race. Actually like, uh, Segondo is probably more technical huh. than, than this race. What about mm -hmm. lost and found? Uh, lost and found was less technical, less tech, but by a landslide, no, or? just barely just a couple, uh, single track sections, very close to lost and found actually, which is another gravel, uh, grinder. Good to know. So that way, because I feel like there's a big misunderstanding with Tahoe trail 100 is that it's like a really, like it's a gnarly mountain bike race. And no. So there was one gnarly section, but they took it out mm -hmm. and they made it like just a, a fire road descent. Yeah. So if I'm good. saying it's not gnarly, it's not gnarly. There we I go. did the, uh, end up with the racing Ralphs on front. Two point, what is it? Two point three, I mm -hmm. think. And then the uh, Thunderbird on back. For me, that was a great tire. Yeah, it was. It, I I chose it because of rolling resistance, and I wanted to use it at Leadville, which is even less technical than yeah. I've heard. 
the entitled trail. Yeah. Um, One quick question no that I have for you on this is how did, did you ever feel a lack of confidence in the back end because that, that tire has such minimal tread? There was one section where a junior, uh, he lost traction on a very steep climb. Mm -hmm. And for some reason he put his bike like sideways over the whole, <laughs> the whole course <laughs> and was like looking at his front tire. And, uh, I, I had to like kind of slow down and then kind of do a track stand and accelerate. I lost traction there, but I mean, it's that not was the only time yeah. exactly. It wasn't anything normal riding. I was just fine, but I'm also heavy. 185 pounds. You get a little more. Exactly. And leaning back. And what pressure were you running? Do you remember? Mm, I think I was uh, 22 in the front and like 25 in the back. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so your, your goal was to go sub six on this yes. sub six hours. It's 67 miles, a hundred kilometers. Uh, uh, but you were also looking to, I think, get a better corral position. That's the whole point of doing this race. One is training for Leadville and, uh, to get a the green corral position, which is right kind of in the middle or one step up from the middle of yeah. all the corral. Gotcha. Because if you if you don't have a qualifying time and you've not done it before, you're in the white corral. And from what I've read, that can add 30 minutes of your t hmm. to your time because of all the people you have to go through. And um, there's could a lot of people. very well be more even. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who are, um, maybe they qualified in the last corral. And if they're in front of you on the single tra track climb and climbs and stuff where they're all walking their bikes. You have to walk your bike. Yeah. From a, a friend of the podcast, Eldon Nelson, he was telling uh, me that one of the things that he actually learned to look for in a shoe for Leadville when he was starting back there in that white corral, you know, was a shoe that's easily walkable because he would spend a good amount of time walking because yeah. he'd be stuck behind folks. So, so it's really smart to do these sort of races to try to move up. Yep. Uh, did you, and so your stretch goal was 515. Yep. That was in... I did. That would have put you in the different corral. The red corral. It yeah. goes gold, silver, red, green. Yeah. Gold is like just the top, top pros. Yeah. Silver are very good age groupers. Mm -hmm. Reds, you're pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And green, you're also pretty fast. But I, I feel like red, red's like the four watt per kilo riders, I think. So where you would be. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. And I was, I, so I tried for it. I didn't get it. I got mm -hmm. 527. Mm -hmm. Um I got, I had, a, so one thing I've never had this happen before, but I hit a big rock descending mm -hmm. and my, my front tire kind of, um, it didn't get a, it didn't get a puncture in it, but it kind of delodged itself from the rim. So it burped as yeah. they call it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, it kept going down and down and down and I was going to wait for an aid station, but I, I couldn't. So I stopped and I used CO2 mm -hmm. and actually when I put that in, you could hear it get back on the bead. Yeah. Pop back yeah. on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Schwalbe's can have a tendency, especially to be a little tight on the bead. And when they pop off on those rims that you have can be pretty tight. When they pop off, it's hard for it to get back on all the way. I have the Roval. I'm not sure which Roval ones are, but they control SLs. I okay. believe they're called. Yeah. Uh, basically everything went well. I did my one day carb loading where I just ate a ton of carbs. Mm -hmm. Um, the morning of, I did a big bowl of Ezekiel cereal <laughs> with blueberries, mm -hmm. probably around 800 calories, mm -hmm. mostly carbs. Uh, and then I did the same nutrition strategy I talked about last time, which is uh, kind of two bottles an hour with a, uh, a Honey Stinger Chew bag mm -hmm. and a Science and Sports gel. Mm -hmm. And then I did some Martan uh, drink fluid, the 360 and a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. And people ask me, so the 360 has like 90 calories in it? Mm -hmm. Or no, sorry, not 90 grams it's of carbs 90 in it. 90 grams of carbs, yeah. Yeah. I could have chosen to space those out over two bottles. Mm -hmm. So they have the 160 packets, yeah. but I kind of like the idea of having the 360 in one and then water yeah. because there's this whole race. I had a, a change of flavors. Yeah. So I had Martan nice. water, then I would have the electrolyte, then I would have a science and sp sport gel, yeah. and then I would have like a chew yeah. and the science and sport gels were all different flavors and I had different flavored chews too. Yeah. So it was kind of cool. Um, yeah, palate, palate fatigue is real. It's totally race. real. That's yeah. Real. Yeah, it is. And it can really affect your, your, you can have a great strategy, but it can cause you to not stick to it. It was pretty hot. I was up there riding lifts that day. So working extremely hard, of course. Um, and, but it was hot. It was, it was very hot. And I actually started to cramp. Um, actually I started to cramp when that junior stopped me. Yeah. yeah. Cause, uh, by the way, the junior was killing it. He was like, he looked like he was 12, really? but, yeah. uh, it's, it's it's the you have to use those different muscles to yep. balance and do different yeah, it's things. It's just a disruption in what you've been doing for the last however long. And then it yeah, was a blocks. surge. Like when I slipped, it was like a little surge. Yeah. And then it was like cramp. Mm -hmm. Muscles like, hey, what are yeah. you yeah. doing? Uh, so I would actually have drank more. Yeah. Uh, I, I even with those two bottles an hour, I don't think it was enough for me. And I say that because after the race, I was thinking back. I really didn't pee for about two hours, and then mm -hmm. when I did, it was just dark, dark yellow. And I didn't yeah. pee once during the race, and I cramped. Yeah. 
Um, it was I, hotter than it was uh, supposed to be, according to the forecast. What are we and talking, like 90 degrees plus? It was 92 degrees when yeah. I was up there. Yeah. That's pretty darn hot. Yeah. When you're at 7,000 yeah. feet, Chad's just like, I'm so glad I didn't so do it. So glad. Because yeah. you'd get in the, I mean, you get in the climbs, and it's, there's a, there's one climb no that's cover. exposed, no cover. Yeah. Yeah. Later on in the day, clouds came out, and I felt rejuvenated. Reju- so I kind of had a bad hour in there. Yeah, there's plenty of everybody else, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, plenty of rock in the region, too, that ends up absorbing and reflecting a lot of that heat. Yeah. It gets, gets toasty, man. So you, you had a stretch goal, 515? Did five. I think my moving time was like 522. Ah. But then, I know, so it was fairly so close. close. What? How did your two laps stack up? How they compare? Oh, it was much lower the second lap. Okay. It was? Yeah. So you looked fresh when you came through the aid station for the first lap, and I was like, this is going to go well. So you were probably on track to do a sub I was. 15. I was almost, I think someone said we're on like five-hour pace. Mm. Yeah. You I were, don't know you about were that. You weren't five-hour pace, but you were I close. think I was on 515 pace, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I think the biggest problem I had was the, I probably didn't drink enough, and I had some cramps, mm-hmm. and I... Uh, it kind of slowed me down and then the little mechanical stuff. And you kind of reached a point you mentioned to me where you almost got like all those things kind of added up and you're like, I'm not going to get 515. Right? Yeah. And the last climb, this is, it's tough because in the last climb, I was like, I was doing the math and I actually thought I was farther behind than I was. And I thought, there's no way you're going to get 515. So you might as well, you look at my power file. Did you just, back off? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, well, why well, kill myself for yeah. a 520? 520. Exactly. Or 522. It when doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah. And you're thinking, don't push yourself, you know, because if you push that little extra bit on a really hard day like that, it can have a profound effect on the subsequent workouts, right? So you're thinking. Or the rest of the race. I mean, yeah, just, that too. Yeah. I didn't want to crash either because at the end, you actually descended mm-hmm. some like yeah. big bank turns and stuff. Yeah. The other thing is uh, really, so I qualified for the green corral, which is great. Yeah. And the difference between the green and the red, not really a big difference. People yeah. say you can line up at the front of the green. And you kind of, they put down the stuff and you kind of walk into the middle of the red. Yeah. yeah. Also, someone else said a good point is sometimes the, uh, it might be better to be one corral back. Someone said that they actually do it because the the red or the silver can just start out so, Pace so fast. High, yeah. yeah. Where uh, it's not sustainable. Yeah. So it's better sense. to pace, which actually at this race happened too. I kind of, I seated myself back one corral mm-hmm. and they're about a, maybe... 50, 60 people in the sub five hour. Yeah. That they're all liars. Like yeah. <laughs> there's there's probably like ten or fifteen people in there that are really gonna be sub five hours, but right. the uh the rest of the people uh, I I was kind of seated too far back. Yeah. And then got stuck a little bit. But yeah. that was actually I think helped. Yeah. And in I've noticed that before in certain situations too. I'm frustrated in the moment because I get stuck behind in air quotes, slow people, but then I end up benefiting because then I'm not as worked at the end of the race. Exactly. You're actually getting paced better the first lap. Mm -hmm. And I already had a a huge drop. Well, I think it was 10 or 15 minutes, the second lap, maybe, maybe 10 minutes taking out like the, uh, the extra yep. time to stop with my tire and stuff. So they may not be slow people in front of you. They may be wise people. Exactly. Just the fool. <laughs> it's like, I should think of them. They're on my team and they're pacing me now yeah, exactly. for an excellent time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyways, I think actually I would have <clears throat> ate and drank more. Yeah. Uh, my two gripes are, this happens all the time in races. They don't <laughs> fill, they don't do the uh, electrolyte mix at the right consistency. Is it too much? No, too little. Too little. And I think hmm. at least... I don't really do the goo products a lot for the drink mix, yeah. but uh, it just tastes so like light. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's too, it's the people at the aid station. One of the aid stations, there were, weren't bike racers. They're like, we got juice over here and we got gummies over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> juice and gummies. Yeah. Juice and gummies for everybody. Yeah. And the other one is if any of you guys put on races, have ice, like have cold drinks. Are they hot? On the second lap, yeah, you get that like full bottle of lukewarm Ugh. electrolyte mix, and it yeah. it actually absorbs slower uh, yeah. if you drink warm water. Yeah. Uh, so it's, anyways. Thanks to all it. the volunteers, but we can always be better. <laughs> and I like to say thank you to everyone who came up and we talked to. Yeah. It was it was so much fun to talk to everyone. I love it when people talk to me. And a uh, special shout out to Brian Barrera. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Brian brought me three big old, she's uh, 32 ounce bombers of beer <laughs> from Flatland Brewing <laughs> nice. in uh, Elk Grove, California. And I don't know if he works there or if that's just his favorite nice. beer haunt, but they're, uh, I, ha- I haven't drank any yet, Brian, so I'll let you know when I do. But uh, I think they're brute IPAs and uh, 
a lot of them. I mean, we're talking almost 100 ounces of beer. So <laughs> if you ever want to make my day, bring Chad's me about 100 ounces than, of beer. Yeah, he's smiling more than new bike day right now. <laughs> <laughs> he brought you eight, but only three made it back. Right? So no, hey, just there we go. <laughs> Either That's a lot of beer, though. Thank you. Uh, well, then, I guess with that, so good job, Nate. Well Thank done. Thank you. Mission accomplished. Good stuff for... You're headed to Leadville. Leadville. Uh, let's get into Albin's question. He says, hey there, I've been using Train of Roads since 2016 or spring of 2016 and lifted my FTP from 195 to 340 this February. Holy cow. Whoa. That is a ton, man. Uh, chances are he probably learned a lot about testing along the way too, right? That's what we usually see when, uh, in some ca- in yeah, many that's cases. That's an enormous jump. Yep. He says, I live in mountainous Austria and ride mountain grand fondos, etc. So climbing is what I like to do. Recently, my FTP and my weight keep dropping. I don't take care of my weight, especially I eat everything, but try to cut down on the sugar and processed food. I drink a bit of alcohol when the occasion calls for it, eat vanilla ice cream, et cetera. You know, just normal with her. He says, he says, eat normal with a healthy touch. Like coach Chad, (laughs) it's kind of cool. Says so in winter, I, you could write your own diet book, Chad. Yeah, there you go. I suppose. Says so in winter, I had an FTP of 340, maybe a touch high due to an eight minute test that was in an extremely cold condition. Uh, and that the reason that he says that is because it very well could put uh, whether it's his smart trainer or his power meter out of calibration, I assume is what he's going for on that. He says, I kept riding and felt uh, felt like I was getting stronger and faster, but my weight, which I reduced from 89 to 79 kilograms over the last two years, is now down to 76 kilograms. So that's, geez, that's more than, I mean, that's a lot it's of like weight to lose. 22 pounds initially and mm-hmm. then another what, almost 10 pounds? Yeah, it's a lot. He says, and my FTP dropped to around 300. I'm able to do 400 to 500 TSS weeks, but my FTP just doesn't seem to want to go up. I ride uphill and I keep getting PRs because I'm lighter, but my power to weight ratio seems to be stuck around four watts per kilogram. When I compare seasons, I am faster this year, but I miss about 30 watts on this performance chart from where I thought I was. So faster is good, but shouldn't my FTP keep rising as well? Um, so I guess, uh, Chad, I guess we can go into that one. <clears throat> His power to weight ratio has shifted, but it's pretty minimal. I mean, it's, you know, it's 0.1 watts. Yeah, anytime you're doing around. all the work and you're training effectively, FTP should rise. I mean, performance should rise. I mean, if it stagnates and, and the weight loss is being offset by the, the power loss, or you're basically just stagnated, mm-hmm. something's, something's not right. Now, granted, you may be like pushing up against the limits that your life and routine may allow you to, you know what I mean? Like you may have a situation. Yeah, but if he where, had, I mean, he has evidence of a higher FTP and that FTP just declines along with his weight loss, then yeah. he's not going about his weight loss the wrong way, the right way. So we do have his career to look at too, right? Let's go through this other stuff. Then we'll talk about his career. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Cause we should talk about it in general. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's cover so, the principle. Cause the one thing that I'm thinking of is certain people like, like I know I've been in this situation where with the amount of time I allot for training or the amount of stress that I have outside of training in my life, I know that I'm going to be kind of capped at four point whatever watts per kilogram for me, right? I know that in order to get to like five above five, I actually have to make changes in my life to, to be able to do that. I'm not bumping up against my physiological limit, but I'm bumping up against, I guess you could say like my practical Just life limit. constraints. Yeah. Yeah. So in certain situations, um, you may find yourself kind of hitting a plateau like this and it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're hitting your physiological limits. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're training even perhaps poorly. You might be training really well, but you know, other things can limit it as well. You kind of have to take everything into the picture. Uh, so if you have, if you stay at your same watt per kilo, mm-hmm. people think, well, you're the same speed, but it's not necessarily the case. Right. So if you're on a flat road, you actually want to have, if you have the same watt per kilo, it's, it's a big benefit to be heavier. Mm. For instance, uh, and, and when you're implying with that, the same power to weight ratio, it's not just heavier, but you're also proportionately rise, a proportionate rise in power. Greater, Ex- greater raw watts. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so for instance, I'd rather have four watts per kilo and be at 180 or 200 pounds and be at 120 pounds, four watts per kilo. Yes, exactly. And because then you're going to have a higher threshold. Yep, there. exactly. And you're, you're on a flat road, you're coming, overcoming mostly rolling resistance and aerodynamic drag. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, uh, much better to have high Watts. Mm-hmm. And then though for climbing, I, I forget when the exact, I think it starts to cut over around like five or 6%. Mm-hmm. It depends on your weight and stuff, but mm-hmm. If you are a four watt per kilo rider and you're riding a 10% grade or a 12% grade and you're 120 pounds, that's much better. Mm-hmm. It's not like on a climb, you go exactly the same speed, mm-hmm. um, no matter what watt per kilo you are, it is actually a little bit better. And yeah. you can, you can go on like a, I think it's a ooh, cycling analytics. 
I forget what it is, but there's a website where you can put in your weight. And I've, I've always gone on there and yeah. be like, what happens if I am at this weight and this, you know, power to weight yeah, ratio. Yeah. Uh, so, so it, when he's riding a bunch of climbs and that's what he does, he might very well be a faster racer for his races. Yeah. His performance may improve. His exactly. watts per kg are exactly the same, but <clears throat> how he rides these particular courses may, it may go better for him. Yeah. And you see that pretty regularly. I see that in races where I know guys are roughly the same threshold as I am. Like, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at that YouTube video recently with Dave, uh, you know, Dave's power to weight ratio, he's, he's, he's got a good power to weight ratio, but there are plenty of situations where other riders have the same power to weight ratio, or maybe they maybe maybe even better. But Dave's able to outclimb them because he's so tiny, you know? And in general, uh, so he lost weight this whole time. He is obviously in a caloric deficit, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, it's hard to gain power. At a <clears throat> it's possible, but it's hard. I don't even know if it's possible. I don't, I I don't want to go that far. But yeah, yeah, you're undernourishing yourself, which is a form of overtraining. You're, you're training more than your body can actually sustain. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's got to come from somewhere. You have to make up for it somewhere. Other systems are going to suffer. And in this case, it sounds like some of that weight loss is probably muscle mass. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have, especially if you're doing high-intensity work, but if you don't have the, the fat to burn or if you're not providing the carbohydrate, your body's going to metabolize muscle. And it's like uh, Inigo San Milan said, said your your muscle basically eats itself to feed itself mm -hmm. that's kind of what's going on it sounds disgusting yeah well <laughs> yeah. it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's a cannibal so it works. it's a desperation <laughs> yeah. maneuver it's not yeah. something we should intentionally inflict on ourselves yeah that's a really good point is that it you know if you're not providing your body with the fuel that it needs but you're still training at an intensity that it's, is up here it's overtraining it's overtraining you and know? under I, nourishment overtraining call it what you want same mm -hmm. same end result uh, just mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago i fell on this this trap just for leadville i'm like i gotta be 179 for leadville <laughs> and uh, i started to try to eat less and then suddenly the workouts got really, really hard. And yeah. that's the only thing I changed. And then I went back to saying, no, I'll just eat. Yeah. And the workouts got easier. Yeah. And uh, so you, got, you just got to find the balance. You forget about it. Yeah, exactly. I, I noticed this morning, this is a bit of a tangent, but on the, just on the concept of this, we've talked about weight loss a ton on the podcast. Um, uh, we've talked about how Nate was able to train and still lose weight uh, when he was dropping off, you know, excess fat and, and I, still keeping I, the training really high. I think from my peak to where I'm now, I, I lost 40 pounds, <clears throat> Yeah, which is crazy. Cause I don't think I look like I lost 40 pounds, but, no, you don't. Yeah. but still it's 40 um, pounds. And we're thinking in your case, that was largely fat, like 90% fat. I think it, we did a DEXA, right? Yeah, so we did. it was, I was at 24% fat. I think you gained lean mass. Yeah, I actually did gain lean That's mass. That's right, yeah. So, yeah, so it even fat. it was even more fat than that, yeah. which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. That was just Popeyes and McDonald's. No, there's, and, there's fat <laughs> everywhere, though. I mean, we're not just talking about subcutaneous or totally. adipose. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Other, other parts of the I body. I gained like 10 years of my life. <laughs> yeah, probably. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't be surprised. So the, the, the thing I want to cover, though, is you were doing a workout this morning. Yep. Um, I don't, was it a really long, hard workout? No, it was a uh, Fletcher. I did a, I did Geiger like 11 hours before that. Okay. And that was also so close to Tahoe trail Yeah. that that was hard. And then 11 hours later, I woke up and did, uh, Fletcher, which is just aerobic. So what's your intent with doing that? Are you trying to lose weight with this? No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to Disneyland today. Uh -huh. I'm gonna mm -hmm. have two days off gotcha. and I thought, well, I might as well put it in. And then on Sunday, I was going to do a harder workout when I get back after two full days off. Makes sense. And then crit race on Tuesday without Pete Morris there. It's my chance. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's in Africa. We can I take know. Hopefully, <laughs> um, uh, Jose is not there too. Yeah. <laughs> he's a fast sprinter. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's common to see a lot of people get into this situation like, um, you know, where you end up dropping weight, dropping weight, dropping weight, that sort of a thing. But you end up hitting a point where it stabilizes. And hopefully it's stabilized because you're fueling yourself adequately. Mm -hmm. And if you're fueling yourself adequately and then your weight starts to stabilize, at that point, you really should be seeing, like you said in the beginning of this, you should see performance improve at that point. You should right? see it the whole time, really. I mean, if you're changing one end of the weights, weight or uh, weight to strength ratio, your mm -hmm. watts per kilogram, mm -hmm. performance should improve. You should be, you know, hit, hitting those PRs, racing a little bit better, feeling you know, a little more motivated, the psychological impact of it. Mm -hmm. And really, from a coaching perspective, anytime I see a rider start to lose watts, we, we halt whatever's going on right there and try to figure it out, diagnose yeah. it, and correct it. Otherwise, it's just a downward trajectory. I mean, yeah, he's losing weight, and that may seem favorable on the surface, but his performance is suffering as a consequence. So yeah. it's not a route I'd go. S something that I think for if I'm hitting a plateau is the first thing I want to do is I want to say, okay, am I feeding myself 
the right stuff and enough of it, right? Then after I figure that out, I think, am I resting enough or am I training too much for how much time I can actually recover from, mm -hmm. right? Or how much stress I can recover from. Mm -hmm. And then if that, and I check that box, then at that point, and if it's still not raising, then I need to look at, you know, what other aspects of, you know, am, am I, is my quality of sleep really poor? Uh, what am I, the what am I doing? of your workouts perhaps. Yeah. Or maybe I'm something. just something doing the same thing every day. Right. And I need to change it up. Um, but if you, if you kind of check those boxes off, that should get you a lot closer, help you discover something that you can improve to kind of break through that fitness plateau. Um, which is something that, you know, we come across fitness plateaus, some, you know, it's normal, uh, and you'll kind of, you'll plateau and you'll peak back up and that sort of stuff, but hopefully that can help. The other thing, if you are, you know, you've been losing weight is to fuel for your workouts. So eat those complex, the oatmeal, the sweet potatoes, uh, nutrient timing. Yeah. Three to four hours before you ride. Mm -hmm. Um, so they can kind of get in if you still want to, I mean, you get to a point where you're, you're, you can train so much and it's kind of like your whole day is like that. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to lose weight, you still, it makes it so much, the ride just gets, the RP goes so much lower when you fuel before the workout yeah. and a sweet potato and oatmeal, like you're going to be able to just be more successful in your workouts. And then the future put out more power. Yeah. You're not going to blow up. Yeah. Uh, by yeah all that. performance suffers, not just performance on the race course, your training performance suffers, Absolutely. which obviously isn't going to lead to those better results you're chasing. One last thing I want to add to that in terms of suffering, that sort of thing. I remember in 2015, when I was really trying to cut weight for nationals, it's a my process. sleep just fell completely apart yeah. when I was not giving myself enough food. Yeah, it wasn't cortisol just my... gets all jacked up. I mean, you, you get mm -hmm. to a point where you're just not giving yourself enough and in, in, in particular carbohydrate, mm -hmm. cortisol is up all the time. Mm -hmm. And you try to sleep with high cortisol levels, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't at, you know, it's a very extreme case, but, uh, team sky, they tried in the Giro to get Chris Froome to a certain weight just for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, I think with our lifestyles, people focus too much on weight loss mm -hmm. to try to be, compare themselves to weights and pounds per inch and stuff of pro riders yeah, yeah. when they would probably be much, much faster having a kind of a more sustainable yeah. body fat and focusing on power skills, times, yeah. yeah, sleep. And a more and a and a happier life probably too. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we we I guess those are the principles. Yeah. Let's get into the specifics okay. of this uh, of this account. Alvin, um, that's how you say it. Yeah, yeah, I believe okay. so. Alvin, um, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just gonna call you out. You you <laughs> you asked us the question, so yeah. I'm gonna give you the answer. Um, I can look at your. I know I'm looking at your career right now, and I would say that your 340 test. I don't see the actual test in here, so maybe you did it um, without trainer road but you did some trainer road workouts after that. Mm -hmm. And I would call them what I call failures mm -hmm. on the test. Um, mm -hmm. You did not complete a single workout, even ones at like 0.8 IF for an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would Intensity say he was turned down and, and he mentioned yeah, that he thought because of that cold, the cold room they trained in that is probably an overestimate of his FTP and his workouts definitely back that up. So that's yes. a good confirmation, like signs that I see in this one that, you know, it might be the, like, you know, the, the data that, or the benchmark you're training with is inaccurate is not just an occasional backpedal in the middle of an interval, but a lot of them longer breaks, then turning down intensity. And yeah, then it's it, like a 10 minute threshold interval that you get through five minutes of it and then you plummet. And, yeah. and you either take like a minute break or the rest of the interval is done at 20% well, lower. I mean, this is what we're seeing. You can't get through sweet spot workouts. Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. that's a that's a dead giveaway right there. So sweet spot of all things after an FTP test is is some confirmation yeah. on whether or not this is a reasonably set FTP. And this is great to do, right? To totally. Like you, if you can't do the workouts, don't stick with the FTP. Yeah, yeah. Like don't, yeah, lower don't it. Don't do it. Lower it. You're going to get faster. In fact, it's something I won't mention any names, but... Uh, we've seen, you know, pro riders have accounts oh, on, on train road they're and this the sort worst. of thing. <laughs> and you look at it and they are not training at the FTP that you would assume, right? They put their, yeah, it's just, so everyone feels better. <laughs> they they type their FTPs. FTP in at like 360 yeah. and then every single ride is turned down 10%. Yeah, every yeah. single one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so it's, it's pretty common and something, I guess, uh, you'll get a much better workout if you're training within your, within your means. And if you can't come, I've always used that like sweet spot should be absolutely you know, doable. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't Depending on fatigue. Yeah. If you don't eat and you <laughs> exactly. did a ride, the day, it gets really, really hard. Yeah. Those variables eat, have to be clear. Exactly. Yeah. And if they are, then sweet spot work shouldn't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm running out of gas. Yeah, it's I'm probably it's not uncomfortable, but manageable. Anytime sweet spot work is not one, both of those things. Chances are it's more uncomfortable like is the great way to say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is you're just like, uh, uh, like your like skin this. feels, I yeah. don't want to do yeah. it anymore, but yeah. I can, so I'm gonna, and it works. And I feel like at the end of, um, end of your repeats, 
Mm-hmm. Like the after maybe like two, it's like the last thirty seconds. I'm like, this is hard. Yes. And then and then the next one's like forty five seconds. The next one's like a minute. And then yeah. the last interval, it's like two minutes of me concentrating. Yeah. Yeah. And toward the I end know, of it, toward the end of it, it, yeah. should, it merits real yeah. concentration. But you mm-hmm. can still do it, and then you can repeat it. That's why I know when it's right. So then, if I look at your account, um, Alvin, I would say that the three hundred five is your actual FTP, FTP based on workouts that you've done yeah. and completed. And then, um, so you've lost weight and kind of maintain the same uh, same threshold. strength to weight yeah. ratio. Yeah. If I, I see so you haven't done, looks like in the summer you've been riding mostly outside. And that's another thing people say, and this happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, people come and tell me yeah. this all the time, the email in, you do structured indoor stuff and you go outside and you do the same amount of TSS and your fitness goes down. Yep. And you think, well, I'm doing the same training stress, mm-hmm. uh, 400, I should not drop in fitness, but it's, We've said this a million times. It's not the same. Yeah. Um, especially, uh, I'm, I'm looking at some of his rides. They look amazing. They're just yeah. like, yeah, yeah, in, right. you know, in what in Austria? Austria. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you're doing these longer rides, you know, more aerobically, don't expect your threshold power to, to stay up. the same. Isn't yeah. that right, Chad? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's, 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 that. I really can't add much to that. Yeah. 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 Less specificity brings less specific results. So yeah. uh, let's go into Justin's question. Okay. He says, a question about maintaining fitness. I've heard Coach Chad talk about how relatively little work <sighs> is needed to maintain, and he says that in quotes, fitness. But for anyone using training peaks or a PMC chart, it's painfully obvious to see how quickly your CTL or fitness drops if you don't maintain and continually build training stress each week. So for those that don't know, CTL, to make it more simple, it's just your, your six-day your, your six day. No, your six week week daily daily average. average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he says, I'm through the build or the base and build phases and on to the specialty phase. After placing the next eight weeks of workouts into training peaks, I see that the the weekly TSS is no longer high enough to continue to raise my CTL fitness score, he says. So the question is, which is correct. If CTL drops or plateaus or drops, are you actually losing fitness? Or is this the other avenue more right? This dovetails really well with the last, what we just talked about. That's why I didn't want you to get too far ahead of yourself. (laughs) Go ahead. That's why I didn't say anything. Nice job (laughs) cutting it off. I like it. Uh, Do we want to just cut from there and go in, Chad? Yeah. Well, first, do we want to tell them what the PMC is? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So Training Peak has a a model or a tool called a performance management chart. It just quantifies all this stuff, makes a visual representation of it. A lot of people use it. There's a lot of acronyms, a lot of uh, abbreviations. Gets (laughs) gets a little confusing. Whole can of alphabet uh, soup. But one of the metrics is the CTL we're talking about is a six week average and straight out of the gates, um, from the horse's mouth, Andrew Coggins says CTL does not equal fitness. So let's be clear on that. Yeah. When you see CTL, yeah. th- people often say that's a measure of fitness. Well, not exactly. And so you're saying Dr. Andrew Coggins, he's the one Himself, who created it, yeah. said it's not a measure of fitness, yeah, but everyone on, says it's, based it's on a measure of fitness. Yeah. yeah. So, so what it's based on doesn't have direct physiologic correlates. Yep. So yeah, not, not to get too sciencey with it, but Andy, Andy, Andrew, Dr. Coggins himself says so. Yep. So with that in mind, um, you, you can't just look at CTL and expect to be increasingly fit mm-hmm. simply because CTL is going up. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing to keep in mind is that CTL can't continue to go up. At some point, it can't continue. You, see, you can't right. just start the season at this CTL and then watch it escalate throughout the entire season yeah. and the whole time think that <clears throat> my performance is stagnated if my CTL is no longer going up. Right. It has to stop at some point. Performance right? can be all over the place. Yep. It, it, that CTL can go up. It can drop a little bit. Performance and CTL don't always correlate either necessarily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really important point because no, no matter what, like we were talking about just before, like, you know, your either your life circumstances or your physiological capabilities will only allow you to take a certain amount of stress. And the type of training. You're and doing. the type of training, right? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So we, we get asked to build this, this chart mm-hmm. and it's one, it's really confusing because you put yeah. this the ATL, which is your short-term fatigue, and then the difference between your long-term fatigue and your short-term to fatigue is supposed to be how fresh you are. Yeah. But um maybe I think it works in freshness as in like how tired you are, but not your really performance. So I don't like, uh, you know what I mean? Like well, the, it doesn't paint the whole picture though. Yes. So, so you can look at just that stress balance and say, I'm fresh. I'm, I'm at a plus 10 and I always race well at a plus 10. Well, okay. On in, in terms of your training, you are at a plus 10, but all the other things that are impacting your, your, your can possibly impact your race performance. 
have to be factored into it too. So, so it's just one part of the picture and a yeah. very useful part for sure, but there's still more going on. So it's not as black and white as what that chart says is what's going to happen. Yeah. And perhaps not as comprehensive as many people assume it to be in terms of defining the entire picture of their, of their performance. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's one thing that I found is that uh, if I was to just follow that, then uh, I would not have reached, I, or I should say anytime that indicates that I'm, you know, ready and primed to go, that's not where I race the best necessarily. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting point. I see a lot of people assimilating that just directly to fitness, but really when you get mm -hmm. down to it, it's really not. It's really the type of, uh, I think the biggest thing is the, you can get a hundred TSS by riding very easy for a, a long time, ways, yeah. mm -hmm. or you can be doing threshold intervals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if you have 400, uh, train stress points a week, and you do it like those two different ways, mm -hmm. it's going to be such a different athlete, like not even close. Well, oh, yeah. and different stimuli can, can cause the same adaptations. So for instance, say you do just a ton of low vol or uh, low intensity riding, high volume, low intensity, yeah. and, you, and you rack up this massive CTL that, or this massive stress score. So yeah. you yeah. think, you know, I've done a ton of work this week, but then you go and change that up for a couple of weeks with sprint work where you're doing drastically less CTL, but you're, you're still making the same, you're still creating the same stimulus and deriving the same adaptation because of it. Mm -hmm. But the, the stress scores don't even closely compare, mm -hmm. but you're still just as fit. You're still getting a lot of the same adaptations regardless of which of those two ways you went. And so there's another reason you can't just look at that stress score. And as a contrasting point, you may actually be doing two very different and perhaps one subpar, one good form of training and, then, and it shows as being the same. And there. then you shift all that towards specialization. So now you've built this big base of fitness and you're generally fit, but now you have to get fit in very specific ways. Again, that can impact that TSS. It can drop that stress score mm -hmm. and make you think, oh, I'm losing fitness when actually you're fine tuning your fitness and your performance is as a consequence going to improve. Or just, I mean, too, this is kind of what Justin's talking about. I, for me, 400 is like my limit, mm -hmm. but I bet you, and that's what's structured like all interval training on trainer road. Mm -hmm. If I did, I bet I could handle 600 easy I know you can. for outside, yep. no problem. And then let's say I go into build and I start doing that, like structure mm -hmm. intervals. And I'm like, I can, I was at 600 base. That means I have to be at 650 or yeah. 700. And yeah. I try to do that with structured intervals. I'm or going just, to implode so fast. Yeah. You go outside and you do 700 TS, 700 training stress score weeks or uh, training stress weeks. So you got this big old 700 number looking at you and you come inside and you start doing sweet spot work, 10 minute intervals, and you get in so many a week and try to rack up that same 700 points yeah. and it's going to crush you. Yeah. It, it totally doesn't you. compare. Not all yeah. training stress is created, created equal <laughs> as we say. So we, we kind of want to stop like yeah, yeah. break that. Uh, and it's, it's funny because Coggin says it. Mm-hmm. It's not create. It's not a measure of fitness. Mm -hmm. uh, we say it. it doesn't need. It's equal useful. Fitness, it tells you, you know, how much work you're doing. If your 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 capacity for work is increasing, I mean, it, it, there's a lot to be gained from it, mm -hmm. and it, it's a very useful tool. That the, all these tools are in their own ways, but you can't take them as black and white yeah. as as a lot of people it's, do. How I look at it too is if I'm doing the same type of workouts mm -hmm. and I can kind of use them to compare to each other mm -hmm. and then how much I'm doing weekly to week, week to make sure I don't mm -hmm. back off too much or go too high. But it's yep. kind of because it's, it's all apples that I'm comparing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like totally. That's, that yeah. And that's, that goes back to the whole, all, all of it not being created equal. Yep. Uh, Tim's got a question that I feel like I have witnessed this very thing with a lot of Wait, junior racers. So to answer Justin's question. Oh yeah. Yeah. We should go directly. Yeah. About Tim. maintaining. Give, me, <laughs> give him an answer <laughs> there. Moving on. So let's say, uh, yeah. So let, just the maintenance versus yeah. the, the building, the fitness. So yeah. yeah, it takes a lot of work to build the fitness, mm -hmm. you know, to, to put the infrastructure in place and, and keep on ratcheting things up so that your work capacity grows. But once it's at a certain point, maintaining it doesn't take a heck of a lot. This is something we've talked about a lot and this is exactly what Justin's talking about, but that maintenance only lasts so long. So, so this residual fitness does fade over time. So when I say totally. you can maintain it for, for, you know, using very little work, you know, minimal workouts per week, it has a time course. Mm -hmm. So in the case of like your aerobic fitness, that typically trend, you know, if you're doing a long ride every, you know, five, six, 10 days, even depending on other factors, but infrequently, much less frequently than usual, you can hold on to that most of that aerobic fitness for, you know, roughly 30 days. Yeah. Different energy systems degrade at different rates. So like your sprint power is going to go in, in just a handful of days, three to five days, even what? with maintenance, it starts to decline. Shoot. So if you're not really <laughs> on top of it and your anaerobic power, that that's more along the lines of 15, 18 days. So substantially mm -hmm. longer, not, you know, substantially longer than sprint, but not as long as your aerobic fitness. Mm -hmm. So all these things have a time course. They degrade over this time course. You can 
slow that time course or that degradation with these maintenance workouts, but it still degrades. Yeah. Uh, it happens, you know, and you kind of, yeah, yeah. so I learned to take the good with the bad there. You can't expect to do the maintenance plan for four you, years. You can't just build your fitness up to a high point and then just do maintenance for the rest of your life and stay yeah. at that same high level of fitness. Yeah. That's not, not how it happen. works. Yep. Shoot. <laughs> I know it's a resounding shoot from everybody <laughs> listening. Right. Uh, yeah. So Tim's question, he says, Hi guys. I just picked up the podcast after hearing you guys live at the Carson city off road. Great stuff. Cool. Uh, good to hear Tim. He says, my question is when doing VO two intervals, I often find them to be over my VO two zone. My threshold power is 300 Watts, which puts me at a VO two zone of about 315 to 360 Watts. However, when I'm doing these three minute hill repeats, I typically complete the intervals at around 370 to 400 Watts. So his question, am I still getting the benefit of VO two work versus anaerobic, even though I'm riding at this really high intensity? Should I dial back the efforts and try to complete more than my usual five to six intervals? Thanks for your insights. And just before we get into this one, I see this actually pretty regularly. Like people tend to tie and in, in, in quotes all out with VO two. I see that pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, people just assume that it's really hard. Like when we're training juniors and, and they do VO two efforts, it's like mm -hmm. those kids are basically busting their shins through their skin, right? As hard as they can pedaling as hard as they can. And then they end up, you know, their performance ends up declining. Well, they start out as hard as they can. Beginning of the interval to the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, you the end the of the interval often feels as hard as you can. Yeah, of but course. The beginning is it not. doesn't. Yeah. And that's yeah. a, that's a good indication on VO two stuff. When you start it out, it doesn't feel like you're going all out. Yeah. Uh, yeah VO2 hard. work typically, I mean, you, you dive into it and it's, uh, you, you ramp it up very quickly and you get to a point that's really uncomfortable, but sustainable. Yep. If you get to a point where it, it, it peaks and then it just plummets, well, that's, that's more in line with an all out effort. And when we're talking about sustainable. We're not talking for a long period of time. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, we're talking short stuff relatively. Yeah. Anytime speaking. we try to maximize our oxygen uptake and work at that, that high, high rate of uptake, it's, yeah. uh, it's time's limited. I mean, if you can stretch it to five minutes, you're pr pretty superiorly developed, you've superiorly developed your ability to work at a high percentage of your peak aerobic uptake. Mm -hmm. But, uh, most of us, I mean, you don't have to do that to train. And it's argued by a lot of people, myself included, that you don't have, you simply don't, those, those longer intervals aren't as productive as the shorter ones interspersed with recoveries. Yeah. You mentioned that, that repeatability aspect of it. And when you look at racing, it really does. Racing has that. to be repeatable. Yeah. I mean, you can't do all out efforts except for maybe a final sprint. I mean, <laughs> it's even risky to do it on a preem sprint and a criterium. You go all out and then anybody else decides to do anything at that moment and you're gassed and it takes you two or three minutes <laughs> to rally. That's my hold problem. You can't say, hold on guys, hold on. I'm still <laughs> recovering yeah, no, from that. That effort. was all out for me. Everybody slow down. <laughs> no, seriously, that is a, uh, as a, a newer racer compared to you guys and other people right. too, it's hard to attack and not go a hundred percent. It is, yes. but watch like, watch the tour right now. And, and they got these guys going for these intermediate sprints. That's exactly what they're doing. They're sprinting at maybe 90%. You know, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll go for it, but they know I can't go all out. Cause I got to start, I got to keep racing after this. This mm -hmm. isn't the end of the day where I can, you know, go back to the bus and have my Swanee massage me and all that. It's, it's, yeah. Even, even yesterday, thinking about the stage that we saw on the tour stage 11, where Valverde ended up breaking away from the Spoiler group. Spoiler alert. Bit. Well, this shouldn't be, it's a day old already. So if that's <laughs> the case, I'm probably the last one to spoil this one for you, but it's, it's when he rolled away from the break or from the group, he wasn't rolling away at a crazy pace. I think that they were at 15 kilometers an hour. He was around 18. So sure. A decent difference, but it certainly wasn't an all out, all out effort for Alejandro Valverde. What I do is establishing a break or something, just go too, too deep. Right. Yeah. And then you, most try people to, do. And that's yeah. why it's fun to watch them. Cause you just, you know, that's coming back. So you <laughs> just let them put themselves out there, suffer for it, and then kind of kick them in the, in the gut. <laughs> yeah. The workouts that you've made that are like, like that, where you go for like a minute hard yeah. and then you sustain like low threshold, high sweet spot. I always try to think, okay, Nate, you're going to do this that. and it, yeah, yeah, you're going to do this. This mm -hmm. is what you should do. Not it's two minutes. Hard yeah, as possibly exactly. Can. Yeah. 200% or something. And then just die as everyone passes you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so racing, the power has to be repeatable in mm -hmm. training. You can get away with going, going all out here and there, but I'd even argue that in training, there are better ways to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <clears> you <throat> see that pretty regularly. I think that when you're looking at it, you know, when you're training, you can, you're really focusing on building up that capacity because you can control circumstances. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when you're racing, it's just a very different scenario that you have, yeah. you know, it's a lot tougher. For well, folks. And also Tim, in your case, you're looking at your calculated zones. Those calculated zones are prescriptive or descriptive. Sorry. So we're, we're telling you, you know, roughly the Watts should fall about here. If we're achieving this specific, specific physiological occurrence, mm -hmm. you may be able to ride above that. We've talked about this a lot of times where some people do their VO two max repeats at 150% and they crush them. Other people can push it up to 122%, 125%, whatever. Other people can exploit greater percentages of their aerobic capacity. 
relative to their FTP. So mm-hmm. just because you're going above and beyond, the fact is you're repeating these efforts and being able to do them. Uh, I don't, I think you said five or six. Yep, yep five or six. six. Yeah. So, so the fact is you're doing them again and again, and I'm assuming you're not taking 10 minute breaks in between them, which means they are highly repeatable. Mm-hmm. So, so for Tim, let's say let's, I'm going to throw some situations at you, Chad, mm-hmm. let's say he's doing five to six repeats and he's going at 370 to 400, which is above that 120% classic mm-hmm. VO2 max. And let's say he is right now taking 10 minutes between what would you tell him to do? Um, 10 minutes of rest between each interval. Yeah, just just that that's more about developing capacity. So you're trying to work at the highest three minute power you can rest long enough so that you can do that again. Hmm. So that's that might shift things a little more toward developing greater three minute power than stressing your aerobic system like VO, like we're aiming for when we do VO2 max repeats. So for this case, if he was trying to increase his aerobic system through VO2 max, like Short, true, do shorter, rest shorter recoveries. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, we want to keep keep the aerobic system revved. So not, not let it completely replenish those anaerobic stores, but keep ca- challenging the aerobic system by diminishing those anaerobic stores. And how short would the rest periods be? It depends. I mean, you can go, it, depending on how hard you go and how, how ramped you stay, we, we can work with anything from, you know, the, the whole 4020s or 4010s where you work for 40 seconds and then recover very briefly. In the case of like three minute intervals, you could typically we match it three minutes on three minutes off, but you can dwindle that down to two minutes as your power, your, your capacity, I'm sorry, your power, your repeatability increases, you can dwindle that down to one minute. You can make it very specific to, mm-hmm. to your race scenarios. If you know I have to hit that hill and then I get a one minute descent before I have to hit the next hill, train as such when, mm-hmm. as you start to specialize. So yeah. when would uh, when would you want him to like turn it down and do the 120s and maybe do more repeats or do less rest versus mm-hmm. turn have like try to hit that three basically what we just said is you start to specialize so so early on you know do the, the three minute efforts and take the long breaks so that you can do really highly productive three minute efforts at the highest watts you can muster mm-hmm. and then over time start to you know you've figured out okay I've, I've pushed my capacity up to or my power oh sorry mm-hmm. I'm sorry how often I mix those up I've pushed my power up to this high rate now I want to practice repeating it at that high at that high effort level mm-hmm. and I want to learn to do it with less and less recovery. I'm going to exploit my now capacity. So this is going to be kind of based on what happens in our races, mm-hmm. right? So if he's, if, yeah. if, if he, if he's getting dropped or his best move is that really high power for three minutes, mm-hmm. we should do that in other races, like the, the film that we did, um, at the Boca road race, yep. that one is pretty much, it's like five, three minute or two minute yep. VO two max yeah. ones with yeah. a lot of rest. Relative like would, rest. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, I think that would be the the case of going really hard, but sometimes maybe if he's a crit racer or something, it's just going to be on, on, on. Totally. For yeah. Two e- even the off. events that appear to be really anaerobic in nature are incredibly highly aerobic in nature. I mean, when you go for long, dur- long durations, even if it's punctuated with all these really intense efforts, all the refueling that takes place happens aerobically. Yeah. I mean, the, the efforts themselves become increasingly aerobic. So your anaerobic resources are super limited. You have to be really fit aerobically mm-hmm. to be able to race your bike well. Everything that happens, I mean, you look at those guys who can work at a really high rate and then they punch for like 10 or 15 seconds at a crazy high rate and then settle back in. And then a few seconds or, you know, a couple of minutes later, they can do it again. Yeah. That's because, I mean, we talk about PCR, the phosphocreatine, the, the stuff that allows you to do those really hard 10, 10, 12 second efforts that replenishes more quickly, the more aerobically fit you are. Yep. So even, even sprinters, match sprinters, track sprinters, these guys who have to be able to repeat those sprint activities or those sprint efforts do a lot of aerobic training because they have to have a really robust aerobic system to be able to repeat those high intensity efforts. So if Tim is doing those really long breaks, um, like 10 minutes, maybe he would still get a better benefit from like, even if, so let's say race things are like his race moves are around 370 or 400, mm-hmm. but he still might get long-term better benefit to have shorter recoveries and work the anaerobic si- or the aerobic mm-hmm. system. So yeah, that- at, some, at some point you, you stop focusing on building your power as high as you can get it. And you focus on uh, exploiting or developing greater capacity, being able to do more of it more often, even yeah. if you're taking you know, a 300, uh, 400 watt potential and knocking it down to 360. But if you can do that 360, 20 times for two minutes over the course of a race, oh. you're going to be a, a really dominating exactly. race. I wouldn't want to race against him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not very fun. To Tim race again. <laughs> yeah. Stop it, Tim. Stop, yeah. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> so build, build that big power and then try to work at a high percentage of that power by building that big capacity. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, anything else to add on that one? Uh, I think Chad nailed it. Yeah, I think <laughs> Chad's like, I, think all I, my notes. I think I did <laughs> nail it. Let's go on to Bruce's question. He says, in the past, your podcasts have covered the benefits of training in the heat for physiological adaptations similar to altitude training. I live in the middle of North Carolina, and I'm training for the Breck Epic MTB stage race in August. For those that don't know that one, I think that you start – the lowest that you start, I think, is 8,000 feet, um, oh. but the whole race sits, and I think that it crosses even 13,000 a Dude. couple times. So it's 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 a high-altitude race. Mm -hmm. He says he's training for that in August. I have the opportunity to do a 45-minute-ish lunch ride on most days. Would it be better to squeeze my harder intervals into the heat of the day lunch ride, or can I gain similar adaptations from zone one or zone two, which is just really low intensity riding in the heat? Thanks for the great podcast. Really appreciate all the work your team does to Bruce them every week. Yeah, so Bruce, if, if you try to do those in the heat of the day, they're not going to be very productive from a training perspective. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they're not even going to be very productive from a heat acclimatization perspective either. So first off, you're, you're hindering your work capacity by, mm -hmm. by making your body – it's already challenged with its thermal, regu thermal regulatory role. Trying to keep itself cooled is going to take a lot of your system's resources. You're simply not going to be able to do that much work. So There's all sorts of limitation the... that's going to take place that's going to prevent you from doing mm -hmm. super high-intensity work because your body's not going to let you put yourself in a state of, of peril. Yeah, and just that, sorry, I was uh, sorry for, but I was so, just going to point out that it was the high intensity work is that what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So when, you can do the low intensity stuff. Absolutely. And when it comes to heat, accl uh, heat acclimatization, when you're trying to, you know, prep yourself and, and, and get the, in this case, the boost in plasma volume. Mm -hmm. So, you know, more, more blood being pushed to the muscle, carrying more oxygen, et cetera, all the benefits that come with this heat acclimatization, um, you don't have to do high intensity work. In yeah. fact, well, we just covered, you pretty much can't, but you really can work very moderately. You yeah. work at an easy level and, and over time kind of graduate into a higher level of effort, mm -hmm. but really you're never going to get to a point. I, I don't even know why you would do sweet spot work in the high heat. Yeah. All, all the adaptations you're shooting for don't really have to be done at, I, I can't put a hard number on it, but they don't have to be done at a high intensity. Yeah. I remember, I mean, right now we've got nearly 40 degrees Celsius temperatures in our region right now. Mm -hmm. It's like 105 degrees. It's pretty hot. So yesterday was 105 degrees, it's hot stuff. Um, you can go out and do your intervals in that. And chances are, if you're in that situation, you're going to notice a decrease in performance. And you're talking about that high intensity stuff. Yeah, and you can put yourself in a very dangerous place too. So it, I, yeah. it's just so not recommended. Um, Nate and I, and I, I can't remember if you're doing this too, Chad, but for a while we were doing last year, we were trying to, we were doing workouts in the shower. I, uh, independently <laughs> Low <intensity. laughs> yeah, just high quicker. five each other <laughs> bam that's nice workout gentlemen yeah. <laughs> we're in speedos yeah exactly see it now. Uh, but <laughs> uh it was it was extremely warm i had like a little space heater in the shower with me and then humidity isn't necessary what we found but to, we still did it but we still did it i don't know to why make it harder um i was just like insane amounts of sweat and i'm not usually a heavy sweater um and man remember how hard like the very, very, like, like pet it was hard to do. Yeah. You're, you're trying to overcome basically two, two limiters or two, uh, safety mechanisms, I guess there's, there's central regulation where your brain says, I'm not going to let you work this hard. Um, and whether that's afferent feedback or feed forward from the brain, whatever, it, it, you can debate that all you want. But the fact is your brain or there, <laughs> there are safety mechanisms in place that aren't going to let you work that hard. So psychologically you have to overcome those. And then peripherally in the muscles, there are changes, or I guess it would still be more central to the, to the heart and, and blood delivery mm -hmm. where we increase that plasma volume and, and these certain physiologic adaptations take place. So, so you're looking at kind of the mental side and the physiologic side. Mm -hmm. I remember it was on, I did Baxter and I think a good, when I'm, pretty fresh Baxter's average heart rate's like 125. Mm -hmm. And I think when I did it in there, I want to say I hit like 170 or 180. Yeah. And there you rate. go. Cause what's your body doing? I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. trying to push as much blood to the, to the skin to dissipate that heat as possible. So yeah. there's only so much blood that's going to yeah. the muscle to actually do work. It yeah. was one of the, I mean, that should be that heart rate's like over threshold. Yeah. You know, it should, it's yeah. crazy or yeah. threshold. It was such a hard workout. So I, I've, not, yeah, so, I've never done it since then. <laughs> so, so, so don't even consider doing high intensity in, in, in extreme heat. Yeah. You know, if you want the acclimatization, that's what you're after. You're looking for that bump in plasma volume. Just just do moderate rides at, at the worst. You can make them pretty easy rides too. Yeah. And then we've talked before about how you can do your high intensity work and then hop into the sauna afterwards and achieve a lot of those same benefits. Yeah. So like you do the high intensity work in the ideal scenario that allows you to really, like we were talking just about, ramp up your core reach temp. those new peaks, so to speak, with yeah. your training. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then, so you don't sacrifice that and then you're able to still get the benefits right now. It's the same idea of like living high and training low mm -hmm. where you get all the oxygen to your VO2 max workouts there. Yeah, yeah the, the workouts theory. have to maintain their high quality and then what the other um, types of adaptation you're seeking can be you know, yeah. pursued in other ways. Along those lines, uh, let's just quickly revisit, I guess the, the how heat training and altitude can have similar. I yeah, they don't, they don't have benefits. similar, they can have uh, you, you, can, you can go perhaps? after complementary, yeah, yeah. and, and for, unfortunately not additive either. So, so the with the heat acclimatization, that's that's the bump in plasma volume. Whereas with you train at altitude, and that's a whole other topic, pretty complex one. But that's where you're trying to get a bump in red blood, <clears throat> excuse me, red blood cells, mm -hmm. so that some more oxygen carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Leadville. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've, so you're racing this, uh, you, you, you've moving up on corrals. Chad and I are not racing this. I'm, uh, rehabbing my knee for those that don't know. And Chad's just decided to sit this one out. So, and I don't blame yeah, him. The stars <laughs> aligned and, you know, yeah. life intervened yeah. basically. So Phew. Chad and I, Chad and I are going to be, we're going to be, <laughs> we're going to be swannies there for Nate, uh, that, that, that I wish it could be a couple of days before the race or a week. And I guess that's what we really want to talk about. Yeah, we don't, yeah. I don't know. We were going to come in Thursday, mm -hmm. set our bike up Friday, do a mm -hmm. podcast or two, race Saturday, that leave Sunday. Pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so. It's, it's and we've done like actually all we've done downsides. things similar to that before not at Leadville but we've done things similar to that and like you said the pretty tough part even without elevation that's a really stressful schedule yeah just so travel and stuff just yeah. like travel and then so even then but then with elevation I mean your bodies cool. are just embarking on the the throes of of getting used to the change in in yeah. elevation so it's like that that's almost a worst case scenario mm -hmm. that's what I'm uh, worried about and. So I didn't really care too much, but then based on my time at Tahoe Trail, people are like, ooh, you could get sub nine. And mm -hmm. I'm like, now you get the big belt buckle. Yeah, like mm -hmm. I was saying, you can go sub nine. Yeah, so yeah. I, uh, you yeah. said sub eight, and I said, no way. I think you still can. I, pff, sub nine good, would be well, awesome. Well, actually, I think that January you, yes. The January hero that was Nate, yeah, yeah for okay. sure. <laughs> Maybe not the August Nate. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So now I'm thinking, oh, I should probably optimize this and come in a little earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, We've Several talked about this days. before, the kind of the classic school of thought is either the day of or three weeks. Yeah. But then can't do three weeks. Yeah, can't that's do three unrealistic. Weeks. Yeah. That's good. Like that, just leave now. <laughs> <laughs> See you family. Yeah, yeah. Um it's uh, based on I'm I think mostly what Team Sky said is they actually yeah, Tim saw said said that they go they go to Tenerife. And then the first day they're there, mm -hmm. they see like a 70 watt across the board decrease. Yeah. First day. First day. And then after three days, I think they've chopped that in half to about a 35 watt decrease. Uh -huh. And then 10 days in, they've evened out. Yeah. yeah. It was two weeks in. Darn I think they near. evened out. Yeah. Two weeks. And so I'm thinking that goes, that's exactly the opposite of like what the other stuff is saying that for one day is the best. Yeah, exactly. And I'm thinking, I feel like I'm sensitive to elevation. Yeah. And a 70 watt decrease will make it a, a very, very, <laughs> very slow. Day. I mean, it's probably relative. So to me, it would be like a 40 watt decrease, but still that would be huge. So yeah. instead of Thursday, are you thinking Monday? I'm thinking Monday. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Sunday. Yeah, Cause I mean, even what they, they described with three days in. So if you can get four or five days into that acclimatization or the acclimation really. Mm. Yeah. And it's, do, it's only going to benefit you. I think the day before the two days prior is about the worst, worst we can do. I mean, that's where you're going to see probably the heaftiest impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just be super, I'm going to wake up on race morning and just be so tired. Oh, yeah. Mom, let and, me and you're going to feel terrible the whole time yeah. too. Cause that process isn't a comfortable one. Yeah. So we'll, Chad and I yeah. aren't too concerned about our, our not so much. I'm pretty sure I can drink beer at any <laughs> elevation. <laughs> <laughs> this beer is so heavy. <laughs> uh, uh, any, anyway, that's the idea. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, my wife doesn't know about this yet. So if she's listening, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go into Cam's question. He says, I have a 70 mile gravel race ride slash race slash ride slash rally. I think that, yeah, I guess I'd just call that a ride at that point. He says, coming up in August, unlike most events, however, this one takes place at night with a 7 p.m. start time. This event kicks my tail every year, and I think it has a lot to do with my nutrition habits. How would you recommend going about planning meals for the day of the event, given its late start time? Uh, then he says, thanks for such a great product in Trainer Road. He also says he's gained more fitness than the last year using Trainer Road plans and in the previous three years combined. Awesome. Booyah. Hey, nice. Good job, man. Uh, so uh, nocturnal races. Uh, is it any different, I guess? I wouldn't overthink it. I mean, you're still going to prep for the race in the same way. So it's still that th three to four hour prior mm -hmm. to where you have that high carbohydrate meal complex. I mean, if you're that far out mm -hmm. and uh, I'd, like like Nate always talks about, like we always talk about is avoid fiber, um, fat, 
I wouldn't go high on the fat side of it. I mean, I'm not saying you have to avoid fat completely, but it metabolizes super slowly. So it'd probably be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know that it would really change anything else over the course of the day. I mean, if you plan to carbo load, you'd have to, I don't know that that would really even shift things much either for cam. Like what you're saying, you're saying 7 PM would be a hard time. That's it's easy. 7 AM is the hard time Yeah, that's because 7 AM you've been sleeping and not eating. Uh, you're going to be able to top up your, your liver and your, uh, your, uh, glycogen and your muscles during the day totally and mm-hmm. hydrate because you people can wake up a little dehydrated you haven't mm-hmm. drank for a whole yeah. time and, yeah uh, take your your first the couple days leading into this if you're going to carbo load over a couple days mm-hmm. i mean it, it's not it's only going to shift it a couple hours right so mm-hmm. it doesn't have to shift it at all you can still do the same schedule and then just make sure that your meals leading into the race the ones you know three or four hours out yeah i would stop four hours before yeah mm-hmm. That's, it's, it's really that simple and then i wouldn't eat anything until i would just do water until like I like to do the 15 minutes before that's when I'll do a gel or like gummies or something yeah, just prior and start a little bit of like uh, electrolyte blood drink. glucose. Yeah. Yeah. And, but not any, uh, it's, it's the worst is an hour before mm-hmm. and that can, it happens all the time for me in workouts. If it's like exactly it's an hour. the worst. Yeah. And I get, you just it get a blood sugar crash. It's, it's awful. Yeah. And, and then yeah. you got to race and it gets so <laughs> hard. I mean, good. And you, you can, can, but it's, it feels awful. And yeah. it, it, workouts like it happens all the time. Usually it's an early morning workout. I'll eat breakfast. And then I'll like mess around, mm-hmm. you know, like you know, mm-hmm. mess around before a workout sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I get on the bike and I'm like, oh, oh, it's been an hour. And then after I get through a couple sets, you just feel so yeah. tired and drained yeah. uh, and it's no fun. So don't do that. I, I, I've, I've found that, so I've raced a couple, I, or I should say I've done, uh, I've done an Everesting uh, ride. I don't know if I've told you guys about that before, no. but, um, that, and then also tell us more. <laughs> vaguely yeah, remember. I, should, I should tell you all about it. Uh, that, and then, uh, we did that Rockwell relay. Those are the two times I've ridden mm. through the night. Um, I've done actually longer night rides. Um, but anyways, with all of those, I've just found that if I, instead of looking at my meals, like I eat at six, I eat at noon, I eat at six. And that's my meal structure. Like, mm-hmm with all training, I find that if you look at, you know, your meals and your, the food that you're taking in is fuel for your workouts and filling up at the appropriate time, I've found that you're able to kind of transcend a lot of that. Like you're able to basically get across a lot of the barriers that stand in your way otherwise. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's kind of the same thing. And it's hard because you'll be sleepy, but yeah, <laughs> you know, for camp too, I would probably be eating like white rice, mm-hmm. um, white potatoes without the skin, mm-hmm. uh, over the course of the ride. No, no, or prior. Prior day of, because it's because I don't want the fiber of what maybe like a brown rice would have. Because yeah, I don't yeah, want the fiber rice, yeah. to uh, to empty me during the exactly. race. Exactly. Though I've never had besides triathlons where you run yeah. for a bike race, I've never had the problem. But yeah, uh, you can also not worth risking it. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> Some people, I don't know if this is healthy, so you shouldn't do it. But uh, <laughs> oh, good, this will be great. <laughs> <I've> <laughs> during triathlons, this has helped as I would take um, a modium AD, mm. which stops you up mm-hmm. because I kept having the problem where during the run, oh, yeah. it just, everything just wants to empty yeah. out. And then yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd miss my goals or I'd yeah. be curious to see how you do now that you figured out nutrition. Oh, I smash it. I've had so uh, many on, you know, like all I my, bet you wouldn't face those problems. Well, perhaps not, to maybe the same not degree. that problem, but I had so many problems. I had thinking back when I was a triathlete, so many long runs when I thought I was just a bad at long runs when really I didn't have enough carbs and I would get that huge crash and I would just walk and I'd feel so horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, I think now with what I know and, you know, and I, my nutrition was bad and I was just, this is when I was younger too, like 25, 26, 27. You were eating anything and everything. Oh, well, I do right? three workouts a, a day <laughs> and I'd just be McDonald's three times a day. And I was still... I was probably the same body fat that I am now, or even a little bit less. Yeah. But the amount of carbs that I was eating, I was very high fat and very high protein. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I do like a, like a 13 mile run would be just the last three miles. I would just crash and be yeah. so the tired. Quality of the food so low too. Exactly. Yeah. yeah all that. So, uh, I, I, I'm going to make a comeback one of these days we and, yeah. and we're going we're gonna to all do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not doing Kona, but, um, I'll be there to cheer you. Don't on. you want to do it once just to say you did it. John, see, he's the most likely to be able to qualify too. Like I, I yeah. want to do a half maybe, uh, next Terra for sure. I want to do a half maybe, but I don't think I want to, with a, a full would be tough. And, but if I'm going to do a full, I guess I might as well be, I don't know. That's yeah, at, exactly the respect to those athletes. It is, yeah. I can't describe to anybody that hasn't been to Kona, 
My goodness. It is like, it's like the worst possible conditions you could possibly Hot and think wind. Of. It's a hair dryer. <laughs> yeah. And then it's humid at Crazy other points. And then it's yeah. just, oh. It's a humid it's hair dryer. So... Um, <laughs> yeah. If you, uh, Jonathan, if you're doing, so you in an Ironman, you're going to have an advantage because you are so aero. Mm-hmm. And if you can hold that, that even though you're putting out less power, you're burning less calories than everyone else. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. if you can still eat that time, yeah. you're going to come into the run relative to other people yeah like so much better and your first what was your first 5k it was 18. so so john didn't even train it's just all the triathletes out here like you'd be so jealous you didn't even like you didn't really even train for it. you ran like no. six times he came out and ran an 18 minute 5k mm-hmm. oh people train their whole lives it's and never Kona. hit a it's not 20. <laughs> no but i'm just it just shows your potential <laughs> yeah yeah to do yeah. that uh and yeah. Yeah. come on john <laughs> exteriors though you should also do very very well in yeah, uh, I'd like to try one of those. I have to figure out how to swim effectively first, though. It's not even that important. I mean, that sounds like a joke. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a joke, but for the Ironman racing, yeah. you could do with how fast you could run and bike. Yeah, You don't really have to be that good of a swimmer. And it's sad for swimmers, yeah. but you could do probably a – I bet you could do a 115 swim or 110, 120, even a 120, yeah. and still qualify for Kona with how fast your bike and run would be. Who knows? That would be brutal. Yeah, brutal. You'd be fine. You're good at long stuff too. You just got to dig deep, dude. That's all you got to (laughs) do. That's all I got to do. Let's go into Matt's question. Actually, it's very online with what we're talking about. He says, I've heard that excess carbohydrates can be stored as fat uh, for long-term storage. And he references Race Weight from Matt Fitzgerald, that book. He says, how can an athlete carb load for two to three days before an event without the worry of fat production? Would a seasoned athlete simply have more capacity for glycogen stores? Or is there something else going on? I've, I've often wondered the same thing. We've actually kind of talked about this before. Like, you know, you carb load. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the race and you're always like, okay, so chances are I'm going to carry this much more weight. And it's not just because of the the fat production, you're carrying a lot more water. It's a water and glycogen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you're dealing with that weight gain, but specifically with fat. Yeah. I mean, short of actually measuring muscle glycogen, which nobody's going to be able to do, you just have to kind of eyeball it. You Mm -hmm. have to figure it out. So like Nate's done it enough times that I think he knows what he can tolerate and what he can't tolerate. And while he may be actually adding more to the system than his body needs, if he packs away a pound of fat or half a pound of fat prior to a race, it's not the worst thing. Mm -hmm. At least he knows his muscles are topped off. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Excess carbohydrate only goes one place. It's fat stores. Mm -hmm. So if your, your liver's already topped off, that's not a hard thing to do. And you've already carb loaded or eaten enough that your muscles are basically topped off. Then the excess will, will indeed go to fat. Yep. Um, but, and, and yeah, you're going to be a heavier racer too, if you carb load, because like we were just talking about for every, every gram of carbohydrate that's stored, you store about three to four grams of water. Yeah. So it's a lot. there's, there's, but that, yeah. that's not a bad thing either. Now you yeah. got a whole bunch of water on your system. You're exactly. super hydrated. Awesome. So, yeah. so it's just, it's really just upsides, but you can overdo it. And if you overdo it, you add a little bit of weight, but the fact is, this is a short term, you know, temporary, uh, dietary alteration. So it's not, it's not like you're going to, uh, come out of it with a weight issue. Right. So, yeah. and, and probably any of that excess fat, it, a lot of that's going to get used on, on race day too. I'm not, mm-hmm. what type of event are we talking about here or are we? And yeah, nothing in particular. Yeah. But if it's a long, slow event, you're going to be using some fat too. Hey, yeah, a fair amount good. of it. The other thing <laughs> to think about is, uh, that we've talked about with racing, but it's how many, uh, grams of carbs can you absorb per hour? Mm-hmm. So don't put in your stomach, your, you know, if you're going to, if you are going to carb load, don't do it in two meals. Yeah. 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 Don't just yeah. yeah. I mean, your, exactly. Yeah. Your, your muscles can only uptake so much of that, of that carbohydrate yeah. at one time. Yeah. So yeah. it has to be administered in a way that your muscles can absorb mm-hmm. and then, you know, you dose it again, they absorb some more, but you can't just slam it all in there and expect it to go to the place you want it to. And this your muscles. digestive system too. Like it simply may not be able to yeah. deal with yeah. just packing it. Full this is why when stuff. I like to do it, I, I like to do high fiber, like mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. complex carbs and then space out over the whole day. Cause what I might, I don't know if it's true or not, but in my brain, <laughs> I'm thinking that digestion is more, um, like smoothed out mm-hmm. rather than like spike. Like if I drink uh, a gallon of juice, Tart all at once. Gallon of Coca Cola, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. you might get a whole bunch of carbs all at once, but my body's not going to be able to absorb that. Mm-hmm. But if I eat some, some comp like Ezekiel cereal in the morning, then I do a sweet potato, then I do some carrots, and then I do some brown rice, and then I do another sweet potato, mm-hmm. and then I do some whole wheat you bread. You have the benefit of time; you can make it higher quality carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then he asks, uh, would a seasoned athlete simply have more capacity for glycogen stores? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So the like a, a well-fed, untrained person. Uh, per kilogram of muscle weight store about 80 millimoles. Mm. So, so it's not really important what millimoles are, but let's just focus on the number 80. So 80 of these millimoles per kilogram of muscle 
in a regular person. You take an endurance trained athlete, they can be you know, well over 100, 120, uh, substantially more. We're talking safely 50% more. Then you take a carb carbohydrate loaded, a carb loaded endurance athlete, they can jack that up to, I mean, three times, well, you know, roughly three times that amount. Imagine 200 millimoles per Whew. kilogram of muscle. That's so what that's I'm going a, for. And that's a whole lot of sugar already in the system, in the muscle where it's going to be utilized. Nothing you have to take in, it's already on board and awaiting its its use. That's a ton. And, and that's that kind of backs up the point that like you that we see with like elite level athletes they aren't just pro level riders but they're pro level eaters from one respect too in other words they train their bodies also to be mm -hmm. able to take in and store more mm -hmm. it's it's more effective well, let me frame this another way if you have a 155 pound athlete or 154 pound athlete 70 kilograms mm -hmm. Um, or not even an athlete, just a regular person on in their muscles at that moment, probably about 400 grams of carbohydrate. That's a pound. Yeah. But you, you double that for, for an endurance trained athlete. And we're looking at 800, you know, six, seven, 800 and bigger <laughs> athletes, even more. And then you carb load. That's a ton of sugar. That's again, ready and waiting. Heck yeah. That is what I'm going for. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. Lost and found. I did it for two days. I had just felt great the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, at Carson City, I did it for one day. Still felt pretty good. I had that. I shouldn't think I should have drank more. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, just in case someone looks at my ride, we didn't mention this, but mm. we think my uh, power meter. Ah, uh, yeah, we should say that. Yeah, yeah, is yep. reading low because if you look at the the power numbers I was doing, I was doing like my like a 890 VAM yeah. at like 230 watts, which is for those VAM is vertical ascending meters. Mm -hmm. um, per hour. That's mm -hmm. like a rate if you can compare stuff. But just looking at the numbers, I we, we think that my 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 cork is reading low and it's been reading low since I ch switched chain rings and there's a firmware update. We I got to look into it to see why, but yeah. If you look at it, it looks like I put out pretty much no power the whole it's time. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, you exactly. are very aero. Exactly, <laughs> arrow zero and mechanical it's the, resistance. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, we compared it to another listener and um he was putting, he's lighter than me mm -hmm. and put out more power than me. And I was putting out a whole bunch of time. Yeah. It made him feel bad about his tires. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's just the uh, power meter. Right. I'm sure that would be the case. Uh, this is kind of a fun uh, discussion. This one's from Daniel. Uh, he says, what are some good strategies and tips to win a flat, bi flat bike race against a big group that has both individuals and teams if you know you are one of the strongest? It would be good to know also what to do against people that you usually compete against, but also if you're going to another state's race in which you don't know the riders that much. It's kind of a fun conversation. The assumption mm -hmm. here that we're operating on is if you know you're one of the strongest, okay? So that's like a key assumption for this. Um, we can cover the other end of things it's a, too. It's a fun thing. But, um, you know, I guess when you look at this, let's take on the knowing competition one first, I guess. That's probably an easier one to do. Mm -hmm. If you know them, something that a lot of people forget is if you know who they are, they probably know who you are too. Yeah, it's pretty common. <laughs> Unless you've relocated, you've come up through the ranks with these same people. So yeah. you maybe all started at Cat 4 5s together and worked your way up to Pro 1-2 and, mm -hmm. and you're all racing together. So you're all known quantities. Yeah. And that's it's common, especially as you get into Masters where you're in five-year age brackets. Then you really know your competition. It, it, it trims down to just a few riders who you really have to watch and, and be worried about. Tactically speaking, racers can be very guilty of looking at things from a vacuum of their own perspective. And it's, that's as if you know that's the only perspective that matters. And if you can, you know, bring yourself to the point where you can actually comprehend how everybody else is also considering you, you will have a huge advantage. Mm. Um, because when you can, <clears throat> like when I'm racing and I know if a person, let's just say that a person says that I know Jonathan can't make a break stick. Then in that case, if I know that's what they think, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter what I think. Yeah. If I can actually use that against them. Well, you're a known quantity. You don't have to be a one trick pony. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you can develop some versatility that actually makes you a little more of a threat on, in, in other ways. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, the strategy, if they're known, you kind of take the Peter Sagan approach that you see pretty commonly and you piggyback on the, if there's a team, you piggyback on the strong yeah, team. If you're one rider working against a team, you kind of got to suss out who that best team is, or maybe who some of the best riders are and who's riding in support of them. Mm -hmm. The one thing you'd have to be careful with though, is the tactics that the team could employ to try to get you off of that train. If we they're talked, smart enough, yeah. We talked a lot about that on, you can look on our YouTube channel on the crit analysis that we did with Pete Morris on the local criterium, where he was actually putting in certain tactics to be able to push a guy off the back of a, of a breakaway. We're talking about a few things. When they say strongest, I'm thinking not the best sprinter. So one, one thing we see Peter Sagan do it, he latches on to another sprinter's train. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, it seems... 
if people are always like, it's about your team, it's about your team, it's about your team. No, it's about position where yes. you're at because the wind doesn't know that you're wearing a different color jersey, yeah. Yeah. right? You get, it's actually, I think it's actually better to sit behind a sprinter's team's top sprinter. Yeah. So that when they start going, you have the initial lead out. It's a capper seat. It's a place, it's the best place to be. Exactly. Yeah. So it's better like not to have your own train unless yeah. your train is just your amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you, if you have a couple lead out trains sitting side by side and they're both doing the same, same work, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a pretty rare instance. It doesn't right. usually work out that way. And we're watching the tour this year and it's just quick step, quick step, quick step. Here. So, <laughs> yeah. so where do you go? You get on Gaviria's wheel, right? Yeah. So for sprinting, I think that's a known thing. I think most people know that and everyone's fighting for that wheel. Totally. Right? But for, let's say it's just, um, Daniel's just has the highest power to weight or he thinks he's just for a flat crit, just raw Watts. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you then work to kind of piggyback on a team assuming this, that they're still known and everything else right like yeah he knows like oh that's the that's the that's the the area's really fast team mm-hmm. not going to win a sprint how would they well, we're talking about a flat road race in which case there's going to be a break there's mm-hmm. probably going to be several breaks mm-hmm. um so he's just kind of got to roll the dice and either initiate a break and hope good riders go with him or be part of a good break and that too means knowing your competition i yeah. would say you'd want to be but in if the, you don't in the break with someone from the fast team. Of course. Because if you're in the break without someone from the fast team, they're going to pull you back. If you know who the fast team is. And if yeah. you know, I mean, even even then, the fast team are, are, are probably saving their better riders for later moves. Yeah, I was just so, going to say that. If I'm the team and I'm in that situation, I'm anticipating because I know that you're fast. Remember, you're not the only one that knows that you're fast. Mm-hmm. So in that situation, I'm going to send guys that are genuine threats up the road and see do as much as I can to try to get you to chase people down so then when we really want to launch the move, we can. It's really about how much information you have. If you have a ton of information, you can really map things out. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you see, when you know there are five strong teams and each of those teams has a rider up the road, there's a chance that break will stick. There's a, there's a strong chance they're not going to chase because they've got a rider in it. They're represented. Mm-hmm. But if you don't know who the strong teams are and people go away, it's, it's really is a roll of the dice. Mm-hmm. It's like, do I go with that and gamble and hope that that's the break that sticks? Mm-hmm. Do... It's it's a crapshoot. So I think for Daniel, if you don't know anybody, I think you kind of have to go. So we're flipping the tables now. You don't know anybody. Yeah, it's if Daniel right. doesn't know anyone. Okay. Um, but he thinks he's the strongest. <clears throat> yeah. He's got to go for every break. You can, and you can uh, you can kind of again roll the dice and get up the road and see. You know, hope that somebody comes with you because you being unknown, they're going to be. No, not you it. start the break, but you you oh, get, get into in the break. Yeah. If 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 you see three people go off, mm-hmm. um, I think if if. They're the strong. If he's the strongest yeah. and he's got like, he's not going to get gassed each time. Sure. You get in there each time. You can quickly yeah. gauge the strength of the break though. I mean, yes. if you're the guy taking the strongest pulls and every time you slip off to, to get back in and, and everything slows down or you see people taking short pulls, skipping pulls, you know, this is probably not a break I want to bank on yeah. and, and abandon. Yeah. So once again, the tables are turned now. It's unknown. Let's assume just like Daniel said, you know, you go to a different state and you're racing and you don't know anybody there, any of that situation. And if that's the case, you can't just be the puppy dog that chases everything down because no matter how fit you are, you a can rider for as long as you last. Exactly. A rider with much less uh, fitness could very well outdo you just because the, you know they they are the ones that play it right while you've been exhausting yourself trying to chase everything down. So the the tricky thing is if you don't know anybody is I mean uh, you know you really have to start judging books by their cover so to speak you know um, give them the leg test look at their legs look at the kits <laughs> see who looks most uniform well put S- together sounds simplistic but Nate said you know the best looking kits and the biggest legs yeah, yeah. find the guys if that, you have nothing else to go on that's not a bad place to start find the guys that all are wearing skin suits instead of slightly baggy jerseys you know like just little things like that you start to look at it the guys that are on aero bikes all of them instead of just on you know a mix of climbing bikes you know. If you have a team and a guy's got like a, a, a big old Grand Fondo bike with a tall head tube and a shock on the front end or something like that, they may not be as serious about winning that race. That's an appearance thing, right? They could be sleeping on you. But just the same, I find that in those situations, you take as much information as you can from that. But then if I sit back and wait, I may very well miss something. Now, to keep in mind that you're not a known quantity, one option that I prefer in this situation is I prefer to dose the pack with something and then measure the response. Mm-hmm. So then I can be somewhat in control of that. 
So basically what I would do is I would look to make moves and see if I get anybody to react. Remember, you're not known, so they may not react to you. But if you you may see some eager beavers that, that really launch out of that pack as soon as a rider goes up the front, and then you get into assessing if that break really is going to be successful, everything else like that. So it's kind of like the attacks we talked about in the beginning of the podcast where it's not all out to the point where you're exhausted, but it's enough of an attack to look serious and to get people to actually respond. And if you can do that, then hopefully you can, you know, you're actually throwing something in there and you're actually dosing that whole group of riders so you can see the, who the winners might be. Daniel, too, if you are, like you said, you are one of the strongest, you could just also uh, wait until it gets slightly established and then bridge up. Yep. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about our 4-5 and 3-4-5 races that we've had here recently yeah. where it's a mix between people who should be P1-2 riders and yeah. then true, like, cat fives. Yeah. And... Uh, on those ones, it's I'm learning it, the the break always sticks and just go in the break because yeah. if you're not in the break, um, especially if, if you're one of the strongest, you either got to pull one up or bridge. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very true. Uh, let's go into Chris's question. He says, recently gotten, I've recently gotten into your podcast and have been binging on them ever since. They've been a great resource with lots of good info. Good to hear, Chris. It says, one question I haven't seen answered, at least so far in my listening, is how to fit in a mid-volume amount of training stress into a low-volume quantity of rides. So for people that don't know, for our training plans, low-volume plan usually has three to four workouts a week, uh, whereas you'll see with a mid-volume plan, they usually have somewhere around four to five workouts per week. Uh, so he's trying to find out how to fit in the training stress of uh, you know the mid-volume plan into just three to four rides. It says, I have a new baby at home and my wife and I have arranged our days such that I have a regular three rides per week of two to two and a half hours. I also commute to work five days a week, adding about five hours of aerobic uh, training, he says. And he says that he also, to control the urge to go harder with that, he's moved to a single speed. Hopefully that, hopefully it's a flat area and it isn't forcing him to yeah. climb hard, right? Uh, so he asks, should I just add a few sets to the low volume rides to increase that training stress and duration? or possibly double up on training rides that are scheduled for consecutive days. So how would you advise so, in this case? Well, Chad? first off, Chris, you've actually got quite a lot of time to train with. <laughs> yeah. So everyone's like, <laughs> we're looking at, I mean, 11 to 12 and a half hours per week is a lot to work with. A I'd, lot, a lot. I'd yeah. take that. <laughs> yeah. All of us would. So, so you're not as, as handicapped as a lot of time constrained riders are. So you can actually do quite a lot. And our suggestion would be simply to um, use high volume workouts. Mm -hmm. for, for your high intensity work or, or do your intervals with the high volume plans workouts. Yep. Yeah. And then supplement that with, with those commuter rides and keep those commuter rides light. Yep. Um, I, I can't think of any time I've actually suggested that a rider double up on, on workouts. I mean, yeah. the, the quality of the workouts just going to degrade so fast. I don't know what you to get out of it, except Only for a whole buttload of fatigue. <laughs> Sometimes you like, a. uh, uh recovery ride or something. That's the only time I've heard you say it. Yeah, oh, yeah. for doubling up? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But never two interval. Yeah. yeah he said double up workout. TR rides. I didn't know yeah, if he yeah. meant like yeah. actual workouts. I think so. He's thinking mm -hmm. that. No. Yeah. So, um, if you look at the high volume plan, there are two and two and a half hour workouts in there are interval workouts. To me, I gain a lot of fitness in those, but if I do them too much, they burn me out. Mm -hmm. Chris is probably maybe different, but also you have a new baby. Oh yeah. You think you think you can do a lot, but everything's harder. <laughs> and you have the routine down for a month, and then the routine changes. And you can, oh, yeah. <laughs> you can get a whole lot out of a 90-minute interval ride. You don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when it comes to intervals, I'm hard-pressed to recommend anything over 90 minutes. I know Nate's doing big sweet spot workouts, and those take more time because he's doing, like, 30-minute intervals. Not yeah. anymore. Okay. <laughs> They're yeah, hard. They take a huge toll. Yeah. 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 So you can take – you can cherry-pick those – those high intensity workouts from the high volume plan, put those into the three interval kind of workouts that you have, mm -hmm. and then round things out with that endurance stuff. Five hours really yeah, played, played a bit cautiously too, though, with those interval workouts. I don't know that I jumped straight into two hour interval workouts, mm -hmm. like we just said. So if you, you realize you can handle it, work up to them, but I wouldn't dive right into those, especially yeah. if you're going to be riding five days a week, heading to work and sleeping four hours a night. Yeah. And yeah. Then, okay, that's, oh, it that can be so things. rough. That's the, the hardest part that I found with a new baby at home is, and I mean, still, even though uh, my son's two now, but it's just, it changes all the time. So like as lock soon as them you, in the room, it's, <laughs> I'm serious, <laughs> put your, that lock on backwards, secure everything in the walls. So nothing falls, lock them in there. There we go. And child protective services are on their no, way. It's fine. Um, they just end up playing. It's true. Okay. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, but the, the trickiest part that I found with that is the fact that it always changes. Like, 
um, endurance athletes especially tend to be creatures of habit and really rely on the fact that they have their sessions all lined out. And, uh, man, I, I've just found, at least for me, that it has to, I have to be more flexible than that. So it's the dread when you're going to bed and you're like, oh, please make it a good night. Yes, please make please, it a good night. I so please need sleep it. Through. Chad need is the. Uh, no kids is Never. just like a, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start, I'm going to go to Chad's house and just start like banging on the door like yeah. two times no, a night. We have a cat who's hand, handling that really well right now. <laughs> Let's so I'm it. getting just the tiniest taste of it and I don't like it at all. The cats are a little different. Hey, I know. People with dogs, it's a little different too. Yeah. 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 We have those two. Let's go into Jacob's question. Uh, last one. He says, uh, my wife and I were watching the tour, especially stage four, when this question came up and there was a four man breakaway. The camera, fo- the camera focused on them quite a bit toward the end of the stage as the peloton slowly caught them. What we noticed is that each rider only took about 10 second long pulls at the front before dropping back and dropping back to the front of the, or to that, it, within the same group. They weren't dropping back to the main group. He says it was about the amount of time that it took for the lead guy to pull off and drift to the back of the group before the next guy did the same thing and pulled off and drifted back. It was a constant rotation and it was very neat to watch. They made it look so smooth. This type of work seems like exactly what over under training would help you with. Yeah. This is one of the things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it says, what is the optimal amount of time to take poles at the front of the pack? Or is there an optimal length of time? Does it depend on the size of the group, intensity of the race, or road conditions? I've seen something similar in the, a couple of gravel races I've entered, and it seems like the shorter poles would be less efficient overall because you're always changing positions. The longer poles would burn your matches up quickly, even though you've had longer to recover in between poles at the back. Yeah, so when, when the pace line starts to revolve like that, they're typically taking really hard poles. So hard, short pulls, really gassing it and fading off and keeping it moving the whole time so that they're keeping the average speed as high as possible. Mm -hmm. That's really what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other instances why you would take such short pulls and be so so ever changing if you're not trying to really crank the the watts up yeah in this situation too like it isn't necessarily like a hard all-out surge in the front the pace is just extremely high and as a result that is a really hard surge at the front for you when you're moving through that pack Mm -hmm. right the 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 pace of the group is consistent but the pace of the individual riders is very much variable between them uh, it, I've it's always... a miserable thing though. I mean, this is when it, when it starts to revolve like that, you're not getting very much time off. No. So you're doing maybe a 10 second, really hard pull, let's say 130% of threshold. I mean, a hard pull yep. and then settling back in at probably very close to threshold. Oh yeah. I mean, just enough to clear it off and maybe not even that. I mean, mm-hmm. if everyone, if you're, you're talking the closing kilometers of a race or the, or the packs closing in on you you're not getting any rest no. when it starts to revolve like that. I've noticed that the, the, the things that I weigh when I'm talking about how long poles should be, because a lot of people ask that, especially like beginners that get to race, they have no clue how long they should be at the front. And then more experienced racers just let them burn themselves out of the front while they think they should be up there for longer. Mm. Right. Uh, but it really depends on number one, the, the group, in terms of the the individual strengths of the group, how fast the different riders are, the condition that they're in, but then you also have to consider the motive of the group and the motive of that, the That's a chasing. super cohesive group. When they work that well together, that fluidly, they're all very intent on the same outcome. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, yeah, until it breaks up, until each other, until they start attacking each other and going for their individual pursuits. Yeah. But at, at that point, that's a group that's working very well together, all on the same page. My main goal or my main takeaway from all of this is that if you, whenever I'm riding with a group like this is that maintaining the speed that's sustainable for the group is going to be more important and riders can skip poles if they need to, or drop back. And then you can reassess if you need to change that rather than the duration of the pole. It's more about making sure the group can stick together. In a a case like that though, it's just going to revolve until they start attacking each other. That's that's a short lived uh, approach. This, this aspect of cycling for me can be one of the most frustrating Mm -hmm. because so let's say everyone has the same goal to mm-hmm. catch a breakaway. But when the person comes through and they don't, they pull light and sit on, yeah. and then I'm like on the back yeah. and uh, the next person doesn't do anything. Yeah. And then they just kind of sit up. Yeah, that, that's that's what like, I'm saying. Come on, let's work. It's those, like, work. Those work together at the end of a long breakaway because these guys have been working together. These riders have been working together for a long while. They've mm-hmm. seen that you know, we're all, we all deserve to be in this break together. We're all doing equal work. We're all pretty strong. Our fatigue's all mounting at roughly the same same rate. So by the time they get to that, they've had a whole heck of a lot of practice, probably hours of it mm-hmm. before they start yeah. meshing that well. Mm-hmm. And when people do mesh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think Pete's it's people are being like malicious about it. They're just sometimes, they, or they're sometimes, yeah, falling but apart. I know in some parts they just, they just don't know. Totally. And that they, that, they, yeah. they don't like the best 
to take pole lengths, uh, one thing is some of the, my best uh, breakaways or chases are when someone takes the lead and is like, you know, 10 pedal strokes. 30 second poles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I like the, the pedal stroke thing because at uh, 30 seconds, no one ever. 30 it's, hard, se- it's hard to watch your clock. I've, I've <laughs> never seen someone do 30 seconds where like, People actually did 30 seconds. Yeah, so. if they say that, you're pre- pretty much counting 30 seconds in your head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can't be staring down at your yeah. computer. Uh, and that's the best, though, when then someone says, you know, you're going, you're taking too long or yeah. you're surging too much. And when there's that like that leader in there yeah. and everyone is on the same page, they all want to catch, yeah. it's so much fun. As and it, it gets fluid like this. And as a, mu- as a musician, Nate, I mean, you played in a band for, for some years, like you under, yeah. it's, it's basically, I mean, it's That's like, totally analogous. It's like jamming, like, and, yeah. and you'll reach this point and somebody does have to set the tempo. Right. Uh, and that has to be decided by the group. But then once it is, it really starts to mesh well and it ebbs and flows and it'll change. You know, you'll get some changes in terms of elevation. Yeah, think about it. Four new musicians in the room at the same time, trying to figure each other out. doesn't sound real good, but no. after they've been playing together for days and weeks and months, well, it depends. Is it, take the analogy further. It depends on, you get a top level jazz players. Oh, yeah. They don't, they just walk in the room and someone good. like plays three notes and they just are jamming. <laughs> that's the same. Like you get in high level writers. It it's just, it just works. No one has to say a thing. That's a really good it point. All these guys are very good at this. They're stuff. so good. Yeah. I oh, like this level. Yeah. yeah. They're the best in the world. Yeah. When you ride like rotating pace lines with like a local group ride, that's one thing. And then if you ride, like when we go to team camps and you're rolling with like the cliff bar boys. Oh, it's amazing. It's, it's so it's good. Awesome. Right? It's so fluid. Yeah. And that, that is like, that's the, 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 the high level jazz. Exactly. They, these guys know how to work with each other, but they also know how to do this independent of each other. They can yeah. do it in any group as long as everyone's on the same page, which when you're at those higher levels, you're on that page from the start. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for submitting the questions. You can continue to do so. We do read every one of them, or at least I should say, I read every single <laughs> one of those ones. So, um, uh, we appreciate you sending all of them in and you can do so at trainerroadcom slash podcast. Uh, if you are listening to this podcast and you appreciate what we do, uh, we'd appreciate just if you're watching right now, you can watch live on Facebook or YouTube. You can like, share, uh, comment, whatever else. Let us know what you want to see us do. Not only can you, you should. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, and if you want to learn more about Trainer Road or what we do here, obviously you can just go to trainerroad.com and check out all the things that we have there, the plans, all that stuff. Uh, really do appreciate all of you joining us. We will talk to you all next week. I believe next week is a normal time. Yep. I don't think anybody's out of town, right? Nope. Cool. So we'll talk to you all next week. Looking forward to it. If you're with us on the live stream, stay tuned and we'll answer some of those questions. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Um, Scott had a good uh, – he said, if you're going to race out of state, check the pre-reg, li- the pre-reg list, yeah. look at ra- race totally. results. Yep. You can see then who's idea. the one that wins all the races. Yeah, we should have. Yeah. You should have brought that up. That's you, a really good idea. You know what, though? Uh, the one thing that – so USAC has that race predictor thing mm-hmm. as well. And I found those race predictors to be, especially if you're going to a national championship event, to be extremely unreliable because a lot of the time you get these people participating in this vacuum of whatever their local realm is. And then you get another person participating in something yeah. else and it varies so much. So when you look at results, you have to have that grain of salt. Grain yeah, that's of salt. true. Racking up a lot of points in the NCNCA is a lot harder than yes. other, other districts. There was a guy I remember at national championships in 2015 and he had so many points on all of us coming into cross country nationals and he was from Kansas. So we were at Mammoth Mountain. It's 8,000 feet is mm-hmm. where, or 8,500 is where we started. He went out like a cannon and then he blew up and he wouldn't get out of the way in a really narrow section of the single track. And people were like ready to get off their bikes and hit the dude with their bikes. Cause he was like just slowing everybody down so much. He ended up, I don't even think finishing the race. Right. So it's a tricky thing. You have to mm-hmm. have that grain of salt handy. Sabrina's got a question. Uh, oop. Oh, my thing just moved. Um, <laughs> off season question. Pretty much, I'm going to uh, paraphrase it. She's got Santa Rosa 70.3 coming up, mm-hmm. and uh, it's only in two weeks, so we can't mm-hmm. talk about getting fitness now. But she is, uh, of all three sports, she's a weak cyclist. She's new to cycling, FTP of 85. Sabrina is a woman. Um, she's wondering that after this, she doesn't have anything else for the year. She wants to improve cycling. And she's thinking, that maybe I should do the 140, like the full distance Ironman plan, rather than the half Ironman plan. And she's mm-hmm. wondering why would I one pick, why why shouldn't I do the the the, the full distance rather yeah. than the half distance? Yeah. So you're a developing athlete basically, and those high volume plans are aimed at very seasoned athletes. Mm. It's really that simple. It's just too much work too soon. So even if it 
it seems like uh, starting with a low volume plan is going to yield low level results. That's not really how it works. Well, the, um, the half distance triathlon. So you're it's, talking same idea though. Full. I mean, she's she's doing. Yeah. She's trying to compensate with a ton of volume, thinking that's going to make her faster, faster. Yeah. Mm. And that's not really how Got it works. It. So so she she's still like I said a developing athlete. So you ha- it's, you have to maintain a manageable level of progression. You can't just dive into the deep end. The half distance too has more um, intervals and especially intervals of the kind of power you're going to be putting out. And that's it. And a half. That's another good point. It's aimed at a different, it's the same energy system, same sort of stuff, but the intensities and the practice rides and, and all that are aimed at someone who's going to do a full or a yeah. ultra distance race. For a half, you're riding lower sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For a full, you're, you're totally aerobic yeah. endurance. So mm-hmm. if you get really good aerobic endurance, like, and then try to ride at sweet spot. Yeah, and that might not hard. make the biggest difference in the base and in the build. Meh, I still wouldn't go that route. But especially when you start to specialize, you get into that specialty plan, then those workouts are going to be very specific to the ultra distance and not the half distance or the long course. Specific training. Brings specific yeah, I mean, results. the specificity gets, gets more important as she works through it. But I just, again, if you're just trying to get faster, faster, that's, that's not how it works. That's basically just going to bury you and probably set you back. Uh, one from, uh, Liam, he says, uh, what are your thoughts on Cavendish, Kittle and Renshaw not making the time cut? Uh, that's from yesterday's stage, stage 11. I, I don't, I don't think, uh, I, so the tricky thing with this is that the commissaires of these races can decide they, they have discretion. It's, it's totally up to them if they want to enforce yeah, that time course. cut or not. Hmm. Like, uh, for example, I think it was Rick Zobel maybe yesterday. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Somebody sprinted and they've missed the time cut by three seconds. He was sprinting to the line and they said, totally cool, whatever. And there've been plenty of circumstances where people missed the time cut by really big amounts and they let them in. Uh, but I don't even know what the percentage in. they settled on yesterday was. It was it pretty varies, substantial? Yeah, it was, but it varies for every race. And a shorter race means that it's going to have less of, of a tolerance. So it's going to be a shorter amount of time or mm-hmm. a, a smaller percentage. So it's tricky. It's, you want to know my it's, opinion. it's hard to yeah, say. Yeah. I do that. want to know your opinion. Okay. It'll probably get me in trouble. Okay. I don't think for these races, I hate the, I hate the sprints. I hate the, uh, <laughs> individual stage winners. Yeah. All I care about are the GC yeah. because it's, it's so like it, to me, it's not showing who the best is. Yeah. Let's say we're doing a marathon. Okay. And the marathon is let's say we're going yeah 24 or 26 mile marathon mm-hmm. and inside of that let's say every mile is a stage mm-hmm. and you get some really fast runners who are pacing to win the marathon yeah and then jonathan comes out and he, and let's say each mile you get to reset yeah, yeah. jonathan comes out he doesn't run at all because yeah. he's just easy and then on on mile five he sprints across the line and goes i'm the best i'm the best <laughs> and and yeah, and and he's mean. and he's so happy that yeah. he's the best and yeah. to me i'm like you didn't do any of the work. You like everyone else is tired and you're no, totally they still fresh. Have to do a ton of work though. Yeah. Not not the same. It, when people are down 25 minutes, like they it's not the yeah, same. And they, on the sprint stages too, you you just they sit in for the whole time, <laughs> don't do anything, and then it's really like make that a 10k stage race and yeah. just start it. And that have it could be a whole completely different tour. Yeah. Let's do 27 stages of 10k each a day. I would watch that. Of course. Right? No, that would be I, I, so interesting to get all the sprinters there and they can do it the whole time. I like all the types of racing that me- the mesh into or meld into a, a grand tour. So the fact that we lost any of these riders is a bummer. I like that they're upholding the rules. What I don't like is that I, maybe the time cut was a little, a little steep. I, I don't know. I don't even know what it was. I don't yeah. know what they calculated. Like I don't like to see the, the sprint competition or the, the final sprints diluted. That's a right. bummer, but I do like them to stick to their guns to, to uphold the rules and not make these little exceptions. Yeah. I just gr- wish they didn't have to discard so many riders at once. So many good sprinters. A grand tour shouldn't be a safe harbor for, for one trick ponies necessarily. I mean, you know, yeah, but and, these guys aren't one trick. They, I mean, they're they still are. riding at such a high level. I they just, aren't, but they're, but they're sprinters and they're specialized. Yeah. yeah. You know they, what I mean? They won't win any other stage. Yeah. So like, but so it's gone. So yeah, he's exactly. not one trick. He's no. different. Well, and he's yeah, not cut. It's so, versatile. but it's, it's, it's an interesting point. And it feels like the tour itself has been more decisive geez, in the past couple of years now, I mean, we're, we're getting more short stages that go from the gun and they're hard and they're climbing and they're nonstop. And then it seems like we have less trips through endless sunflower fields, which man, I'm all I'm okay with. That's, that's fine with me. So the, the other thing I hate is it's too, it, it, people are the breakaway. They like when they let the breakaway win, cause everyone doesn't care. 
like yeah. it's so really you're racing against four or five people yeah. and everyone else is like, well, we're all going to the GC. It's a totally different race. So you and, don't like how the race is like, it's non like it at some points the race is on for GC and then at other, those points, are the totally factors off. that keep it so interesting yeah. that there's so to me, much it's going on. Oh, I, I, I would, I would rather have it be just GC every stage be mountainous or really short mountainous. And like yeah. they have that, that yeah, F1 that'd start. Be boring. <laughs> that would and, That'd be boring to me. Yeah. And and so every day you have the uh the chance for explosiveness and like a Michael, drama like a Michael Bay. And just a handful rather than waiting for like <laughs> in just a three, handful of riders though. Like ten minutes. Explosions everywhere. It's like ten to twenty minutes in the whole race. Oh yeah. And have every rider have like three teammates. That's it. Yeah, yeah. see that's and people would just blow up and go and <laughs> one minute one day you lose twenty minutes, another it's, day you gain it's twenty transformers minutes. Transformers meets no, meets cycling. Very much yeah, that. rather <laughs> than <laughs> having to wait for it's really I mean, honestly for the G C race. It's could, there could be 15 minutes of excitement over 27 days. Yeah, and it's I just get so. I see. You, I want so do that I take this too. to mean you're not really bent about the fact that all these top level sprinters got cut? No, I don't care. But you know, yeah. the Giro. <laughs> okay, that's so the there's Giro, your answer. The Giro is Whoever. great because every like every day, people. It's so hard that people are attacking each other, yeah. and it's switching. The leader switches, and people can have bad days where Same the tour is just year. like if the tours. I say on tours part been of this happening year. Oh, just yeah. like that. This okay, year. tours been on part of this year. If I'd be highly surprised <laughs> if Team Sky doesn't just <laughs> strangle everybody by the end. Of, I think so. I think they will. of the race. I and, don't actually. Okay, I think it's going to liven up a bit. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who's your pick? I don't. I don't have a particular pick, pick just yeah I, i'm still i'm doom on all the way i have been since yeah. since the Giro last year how can you not pull for that guy yeah he's pretty you yeah. know oh, um oh now i forgot his name the irishman yeah dan martin dan martin's my favorite he's yeah. a courageous Could, yes, little man he that just dude he just pushes, goes man so i i it's want to watch. i want that tour i talked about where we just clone dan martin and he races <laughs> 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 yeah no but i, but I like having some, world some days here. are interesting <laughs> like that and some days are toned down yeah. or interesting in different ways but every day is interesting do you guys know who the best i probably shouldn't say this but i'm going to it's after the podcast <laughs> oh, who the best name in the whole race is primos roglic nope bob youngles bob youngles because <laughs> so if i was bob I would the J. I would have a hard day. Yeah, J. Yeah, Bob, yeah. Hard Bob, J. Bob Jungles. Yeah. And then Bob Richard could also go by Dick. Okay. Dick Jungles. <laughs> yeah. Dick Jungle on the climb. Like, can you imagine <laughs> Phil and Pete? All the things he could say. Yeah, on we off have the back. derailed. We have like, derailed what hard. What are we talking about? I'm bringing us back online. <laughs> okay, but you can cut that out later. But it's just it would be it would add on the boring stages. It would give Phil and Paul something to talk about. <laughs> Let's go into this one. Um, this one, uh, no, uh, we're going to change on that one. Okay, a uh, question from a newbie. How important is good footwear? I don't have foot issues and use regular footwear. Should this be a priority for me before intensity and volume increases too much? I don't know by regular if they mean regular shoes just with like clips or mm -hmm. um, what they mean, but I, I notice a huge difference. Hugely important. With uh, intensity, with long days. I mean, yeah. we've talked about hot spots on longer rides. Mm -hmm. um, incredibly important. And, and, and just in terms of driving the pedals with the high, higher intensity stuff, actually totally. having connection to the pedal all the way around. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about tennis shoes, then absolutely get, a, a, if, if all I can afford is a low level pair of shoes, get cycling shoes ASAP. Yeah. One thing I would say too, is if you can get a shoe that flexes less, I know this mm -hmm. seems counterintuitive. It's going to be much more comfortable. And just because that way your foot, it doesn't feel like you're pressing on one specific spot on your shoe. It's spread out throughout there. And then also for new riders, if you're new to clipping in, having a shoe that's flexible is in like, I see a lot of people, for example, they get like the keen sandals yeah. that have like, that you can clip in on the mountain bike side of things. Those things are really hard to get in and out of mm -hmm. because when you apply torque to the shoe to unclip, the, the shoe just twists. Or, or clip in for that matter. Yeah. yeah. Super so tough. you can, you don't have like a, the, the benefit of having a really st you know, stiff shoe is that, you know, it kind of locks in. So it's, um, my wife has found that really helpful. She went from some average, just like, uh, they were like the normal mountain bike style shoes that can flex but they, you can clip in. And then she went to stiff sold ones, kind of like XC ones. And it's way easier for her to, yeah, you can out. accumulate a whole lot of foot fatigue, a lot, a lot, a lot of joints and muscles in the foot that are, are getting abused when you don't have a stiff sold shoe. A ton. Yeah. And also look for, um, in, in, when you get these shoes, I, I don't think enough people look into the insoles. I've talked about how I get like sure foot custom insoles, but you don't have to go that far, but just get some insoles that feel like fit your foot perhaps better than the ones that come in the shoe. That can make a huge difference too. Indeed. Um, man, a lot of people are, uh, people, a, lot of, a lot of people are responding talking to about the tour. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. on, on Facebook, a lot of people are like, I'm watching Alp Duez. See you later. <laughs> um, someone asked how to, how to adjust our, uh, 
high volume tri plans to be a duathlon plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked about this before. You don't necessarily need to substitute. Um, uh, just omit the, the the swim the swim workouts really. And if you have a weakness and you still have time to train, you can address that weakness with the slot left open with the swim workouts. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, they don't need all that much training. I mean, or they don't need all that much tweaking. You're already they, they already cover the run and swim, or sorry, the run and ride base pretty well. Yeah. And if you find that you have excess time, I'm not even sure that you'd want to weave in extra swimming. Mm. I keep saying that extra <laughs> uh, run and bike workouts. So just ditch the swim workouts. Yeah. Uh, Liam says in the state where I live, the road season is over. All that's left is some track racing and planted racetrack. How would you recommend I target my training for track coming from roadie fitness? Mm -hmm. Uh, we've, we've, uh, actually seen some pretty impressive results with people following the gravity plan for track stuff. Gravity and and short track XC to a lesser extent, but I think Mm -hmm. gravity is actually really uh, the closest match we have for sure, but it's also a pretty good fit. The gravity plan really focuses on like raising that ability to really put out those power, hard power, efforts. power, power, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you could do that one. And especially if you've already got, you know, base build and specialty, maybe like all that fitness coming in, mm-hmm. you can just dip back into that specialty plan. And yeah. Just, just tailor fun. your anaerobic ca- capacity with mm-hmm. the, the, yeah, the gravity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have one from <clears throat> Veronica. Okay. She says, uh, also thanks to train road. I've raised my FTP from 180 last December to current 202. Nice. Um, good job. And she's worried, though, that she'll never be able to catch up to the same woman with those bigger FTPs. She, she says she knows there's a plateau point, and I'm already experiencing the marginal gains. Will I ever catch up? Yeah. Did she say how old she is? Uh, no. Can I just share one thing before you jump into sure. that on this? I, I mean, Liz Lyles, she's retired now. I don't think that she'll mind me sharing her power. Uh, but Liz Lyles is one of the best triathletes in the world. And I think that her FTP was probably somewhere around 220. Somewhere yeah. around there. I, I, I was going to say, like, it's pretty good. My point, like, 202 yeah. is really good. Yeah, she's she's doing great. Yeah. And, and um, you know, you have to understand, like, like we've talked about before, like with lighter riders where they do better than heavier riders and mm-hmm. efficiency and everything else that goes into your end performance. But in terms of power to weight ratio, especially for, for women, you're actually not doing too bad probably. Yeah, and uh, it just um, – if you are – I think it goes for guys too. If you're battling people who are a higher raw FTP than you – you got to stay uh, tucked in behind. Like mm-hmm. the, the thing that you're kind of overcoming is the wind. So mm-hmm. you have to make sure that you are smart, draft. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of the the crit stuff where we see Jose, where um, uh, the crit videos we've done. Yeah. I'm, I guarantee, I don't know Jose's FTP, but I guarantee you it's not the same as Pete's. Yeah, no, no way. Um, <laughs> but Jose just slots in behind Pete and probably gets a huge free ride. I bet you yeah. he's doing way less than half the work that Pete is doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's also the matter, uh, the matter of age, both your training age and your chronological age. So, I mean, if you're 50 years old, probably not no. a heck of a lot of no, room she's to young. improve. Okay. So if you're young, t- there's time to improve. If, you, if you're training age young, there's definitely improvement to be had. But if you've been training for, you know, five, 10 years and, and you've just reached that point, no matter what you do, that would be when I'd start to think maybe I've touched my limit. But uh, unless that applies to you, I, I, I would... Oh say your ceiling is, is far from met. Veronica's probably in her late twenties and she's got a, looks like a, she's got a very serious race photo here. Very like, serious race photo. Yep. Oh, yeah. Veronica looks yeah. fast. Yeah. Exactly. So she, you've <laughs> probably, you've probably got Veronica. more potential. So it might just be a matter of, um, mm-hmm. changing up your training, maybe training more, maybe training less. Uh, I don't know. There's, 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 there's plenty of things you can take. Right. Yep. All right. With that, uh, we should probably cut it. This one was uh, pretty long. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we appreciate all of the, the you joining us live. Remember, share, uh, like, comment down below. Let us know if you want us to address certain topics or anything else like that. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for some more race analysis stuff coming soon. A little bit different than other ones we've done. Uh, so oh, keep your eyes peeled. Teaser for one. Yeah. Hey, yeah. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.